Huh. Staff, are you ready? <clears throat> ready? Oh, we have no city manager. Okay. <laughs> I am. <laughs> I knew that. I knew that. Yeah. Linda, you're good. <coughs> we'll call the meeting of the Capitol City Council to order. May I have a roll call, please? Councilmember Harlan? Here. Councilmember Bertrand? Here. Councilmember Peterson? Here. Councilmember Bottorf? Here. Mayor Termini? Here. Please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Tonight's meeting is being cablecast live on Charter Communications, <coughs> cable TV channel eight. It's also rebroadcast on AT&T, Uverse, and Comcast channel 25. Our technician tonight is Lynn Dutton. Please turn your phones, cell phones off, and when you come up to speak to the council, please sign in. Um, let's see, I believe we have a presentation tonight. Good evening, Mayor Termini, council members, and uh, staff and guests. Uh, I'm here before you this evening. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our newly promoted police sergeant, Sergeant Sarah Ryan. Sarah is a 12-year veteran of the Capitola Police Department. She was pro promoted to police sergeant on May 20th, just about a month ago. Sarah was selected from a pool of six highly qualified candidates. She will be assigned to the patrol division with many ancillary duties that include management of the city's police department volunteers, the reserves program, our explorer program. In addition, Sergeant Ryan will oversee the entertainment permit and alcohol beverage control ABC regulatory process throughout the city. A and she just acquired uh, another ancillary duty. Sarah is taking the lead in managing our recruiting program. Uh, I have displayed here for everyone to see. Some of you were here in attendance uh, earlier this afternoon for our swearing in ceremony here in the uh, council chambers and thanks to everyone who attended. And I thought it was important that I put this picture up because it's a clear indication of uh, all the support that Sarah has throughout the entire county and other counties. We had law enforcement representatives from, from San Jose, uh, from uh, the Monterey County and many, as you can see, law enforcement officials, other chiefs from the Santa Cruz area. And it was very impressive to see all those in attendance this afternoon for Sarah swearing in. So please join me in congratulating Sergeant Sarah Ryan on her promotion to police sergeant. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. I, di I didn't prepare anything official to really to say. Um, this has been an amazing experience for me. And, um, you know, 13 years ago, I started as a community service officer here in Capitola and was fortunate enough to be sent to the police academy. And my heart and soul has been here, um, well, my entire life growing up as a kid here and raising my family here. So I am just I elated with the experience and um, happy that I get to just continue on and rise as a leader. Um, we have a young agency and it's exciting. It's, it's always really exciting to see and to be a part of bringing um, everyone up. So thank you. Sergeant, on, on behalf of the city council, uh, you're one of the reasons why we're proud to represent Capitola, the entire department, and certainly you. Thank you. And it was a uh, well-placed promotion. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Chief. We now have a presentation from the Community Action Board.
Good evening, Hello. council members, staff, and guests. I'm Helen Ewan Story, and I'm the assistant director of the Community Action Board of Santa Cruz County. Um, I want to thank you all for um, the time tonight and the space on the agenda to talk to you about CAB, uh, what's new with our services, um, and how we work in partnership with you to benefit this community. So I'm joined uh, this evening with some members of the Community Action Board team, um, including our executive director, Maria Elena de la Garza, um, and our rental assistance program, or RAP, uh, program. We have some staff, including Lourdes Arellano Perez, who is our program coordinator, and Irene Mar uh, Martin, who is one of our newer members at RAP, who is our North and Mid County um, eligibility worker and case manager. So, and they'll be speaking a little bit later. But I want to start out again by saying thank you very much for the time and your partnership. Um, and just by saying again that CAB's mission, as you all know, is to partner with the community to eliminate poverty and to create social change through advocacy and essential services. Um, and we did that pr by providing services and doing that work with nearly 10,000. Oh, you, you are not seeing the presentation, are you? Oh. Let's see. <laughs> is it, do I need to do something? There it is. Good. Just space bar okay. to advance. Oh, okay. What is that? Space bar to advance. Okay. Or uh -huh. mouse click. Yeah, I did that. Okay, well, we'll see. <laughs> We'll see. So um, we did that by providing services to a little over 9,900 individuals, so nearly uh, 10,000 individuals last year in 2017. Um, and our service provision is kind of concentrated into four different areas. Um, so we focus on community building and youth services, which include things like after school programming, mentoring, violence prevention, um, <coughs> youth and adult employment and reentry services and support, immigration legal assistance and citizenship services and homelessness prevention work that we'll talk about a little bit more in depth soon. Um, we also, uh, every time we present about CAB, we like to talk about what makes CAB different as a nonprofit. And there's some distinct things that, that make us different. Um, as you know, we've been around in the community for over 50 years. We were born as part of the war on poverty process. Um, and um, by design and by mandate, we have a tripartite board. And so we have uh, three equal parts, low-income representatives from the community. We have uh, private sector representatives, including um, the financial sector. We have the CEO from the Santa Cruz Community Credit Union. Um, we have a new health care seat, and we have a new member uh, representing that sector. Um, and um, we also have a, uh, a public, or uh, yeah, a public um, government um, sector. And so honestly, we're doubly blessed at CAB because in terms of representation from Capitola, because Kristen Peterson, of course, on your council, is also on our board, your appointment to um, our board, and is our current, uh, one of our co-chairs for the board. And we really thank her for her really engaged and, and uh, amazing service on our board. And we're also blessed by having um, Leo Moreno, who's one of your detectives here, um, also representing the criminal justice as part of um, the, the sectors. So Capitola is well represented and we're very appreciative for that. The other way that we're very distinctly different than other um, nonprofits, again, by design, by federal mandate, is that we're mandated to have a biennial community action plan. And that means we go out, and many of you have been part of this process and seen it over the years, but we go out to the community and we talk to them and hear from them about what their needs are, what are the top um, issues and challenges they're facing um, uh, to help inform our programming and our services. And this last year, when we undertook this process in 2017 to guide our work in 2018, 2019, we had a very robust process. Um, we went out and spoke to members of the community um, that are very rarely um, engaged with when we're talking about needs and, and also assets. So looking at taking a really deeper dive in terms of what people's needs are um, about opportunity and um, poverty in this community. So 
there's a lot of information there and we'll probably come back to your council at a later time to give you a real um, deep dive into that community action process. Uh, we'll be producing a report um, that we're very excited about um, in terms of uh, carrying the work forward and we'll be having an event in the fall as well. Um, but I just want to summarize really quickly that um, you know some of the top needs that were identified um, in the community this year, some of them are, are fairly expected I think in terms of um, jobs, the need for more jobs, uh, more living wages, more um, consistent employment, uh, rent burden, very high rent burden in the community, barriers to accessing resources in the community, uh, needs for additional health support, including mental health. Um, and one of the, the um, areas that came out that hadn't come out before in our process, and I think it really spoke to the level of engagement that we had with community members who aren't usually engaged in this, is really the impact of discrimination on community members' opportunity. So again, we'll talk more about that uh, when we roll that out in the future. And just to say, we also asked them about assets. What are assets? What are strengths that they uh, rely on um, to help them in this community? And some of the top assets that came out were family support, community support around that, cultural programming, and legal services. So our six programs, so in those four areas of service provision, we have six programs and one um, new special project. So the programs are uh, our Alcance uh, program, which does the youth and uh, adult employment services, our CalWORKs emergency payment program that helps folks transition from welfare to work, um, stay housed, and um, get the, the supplies and resources they need uh, to pursue education, career, you know, start their own businesses, for example. The Day Worker Center, uh, which is located in Live Oak but serves all the county um, and helps uh, day workers uh, find employment and provide services for homeowners primarily in the community that need work done. Uh, we have our Davenport Resource Service Center up on the North Coast, which is a full service family resource center. Our Santa Cruz County Immigration Project, which provides citizenship, DACA services, many different things. And the newest project is our Thriving Immigrants Collaborative Special Project, um, which is really helping uh, support families who um, are at risk of impact for deportation. Our sixth program is our rental assistance program, and that one is in particular um, what your council um, supports uh, in terms of both um, community services, social services programming, and the um, emergency uh, rental assistance and mortgage uh, contract that we have with you. And as I said, it's staffed. We have about three staff members. Um, like I said, two of them are here today, and we'll speak with you a little bit more soon. Um, so the rental assistance program uh, has been a program at CAB for over 30 years and been um, really a um, uh, really a support for folks to avoid homelessness and eviction in the community for that time. And we've changed our services uh, a little bit over time. Our focus really is on rental assistance to avoid eviction now. Uh, in companion with case management, financial literacy, and capability support, uh, we try to really um, provide wraparound services to help support people stay housed in this community. We want to avoid the trauma, the stress, you know, both financial and emotional that comes with homelessness. Um, so you can see that in uh, this fiscal year to date, which is almost over, but as of the end of May, we had served 78 low-income households uh, composed of seniors, disabled folks, families, um, and had, that had received rental assistance to avoid eviction. In Capitola, so year to date, uh, we've served six households with rental assistance. And let me just say, one is pending, so we're hopeful that that would be seven. Um, we have typically, when I looked back at the numbers, we've typically served between seven, eight, or nine families um, each year in Capitola through the emergency program. And, um, you know, we know that some of the impact this year, uh, it's been a little bit harder, and that's frankly countywide, has been some of the, the kind of fear, the climate of fear in the community in terms of accessing benefits. So that's definitely had some um, impact on the services. Um, but we are very happy to report that we have uh, a, a wonderful retention rate. This is one of the ways we benchmark our, our success. And um, so the Capitola Assistance 
that we've provided so far, 100% uh, of those families that we served this year are still in housing. And you know, we started serving folks in August, I believe it is, so between that three to nine month retention rate, they're still housed. And so we feel wonderful about that. I want to just give um, a moment or two to uh, Lourdes and to Irene to talk about some of those success stories. Good evening to all of you. My name is Lourdes, and I'm sure you hear me, hear me very well <laughs> without that. And um, I thank you. I'd like to thank you for your time and the opportunity to be able to be here to um, thank you all for the support that you have provided us. Due to that support, we're able to um, relate to you. For example, a situation that comes to mind is a, is a Capitola resident. He's a single father of a 9 and a 12-year-old. Um, who works in construction and when we assisted him due to the weather unfortunately was unable to work um, which led to him falling behind on his rent um, considering the trauma that his children have been, had been experiencing with them when he became a single father um, the, you can imagine his stress when he received the eviction notice. The last thing he wanted was um, to have his children continue to go through more um, emotional trauma. N needless to say, he too was very stressed at the thought of being um, at risk of losing his children due to not having a proper home for them. So it was a very stressful time for him when he came in seeking um, support. And thanks to your support, we were able to assist him. And um, when we touched base with him, um, we were very happy to learn that um, he still remains housed. He's working, his children are doing very well, and was very grateful and asked that we extend that. Um, so it is my pleasure to thank you in his name and um, once again for the opportunity to be able to um, thank you personally. Thank you. Irene? Good evening. My name is Irene Martin. And Irene, uh, we, can, we can hear you, but our thousands of television viewers cannot. Okay. So <laughs> I'm being optimistic. <laughs> so. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to ta tell you, a sh well, before I tell you a short story that I have, um, I'd like to thank you so much for your time and your generosity. <coughs> uh, one of the cases that I assisted this year in Capitola really struck me. It was from um, a senior citizen. This lady came into our office. She had been diagnosed with cancer, at the be uh, breast cancer at the beginning of the year. And so she had to pay uh, some of the medical expenses out of her pocket. And so that forced her to be behind on her rent payment. Uh, so she came to our office with a three days eviction notice and she was in tears. So we were able to uh, speed up the application process in order to assist her with the, with the rent payment. And we were able to pay for the two months that she was behind. So um, we do follow up calls, okay, after we serve the citizen, we do follow up calls. And I talked to her about a week ago and she shared with me that she was doing very well from the surgery and the cancer treatment but she also emphasized on how thankful she was for the, uh, you know, the assistance that we provide her with. So not only as a CAB employee, I'd like to really thank you for your generosity, but also as a Capitola resident. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you. thank you very much, Helen. Do you have any questions or? Folks, I have to tell you that um, the smart money stops homelessness before it occurs. And we're glad to be part of the smart money. Thank you. We'll move on to report on closed session. Thank you, Mayor Termini. Um, the council had three items in closed session uh, that they discussed tonight. We started about 6.15 and ended about 7 o'clock. Uh, the first item was labor negotiations. Our labor negotiator, uh, Larry Laurent, reported to the council on the ACE, mid-management, confidential employees, management employees, and city manager uh, contracts. Uh, negotiations. No reportable action was taken in closed session. However, the council is scheduled to take action this evening at uh, agenda item 10E. Uh, 
Larry also reported to Council with regard to ongoing negotiations with the P P Peace Officers Association. There was no reportable action taken in closed session, and the Council instructed um, our negotiator with regard to those ongoing negotiations. The Council had to consider one item of initiation of litigation. They received a report from the City Attorney, Anthony Condotti, and gave direction to Mr. Condotti with regard to that matter, but took no other reportable action in closed session. And finally, Mr. Condotti reported to the Council on the uh, progress in the litigation, City of Capitola versus Water Rock, which is the uh, Pacific Cove um, paving uh, construction claim case. And there's claims and counterclaims in that case. That case went to arbitration last week, and we expect a decision from the arbitrator at the end of July. And when that decision comes out, it will be a matter of public record. Thank you. And uh, I can welcome you back our former longtime city attorney, John Barrasoni. I'm filling in for Tony Condotti. It's nice to see you. Nice to be here. Thank you. Um, are there any additional materials? Uh, they were distributed previously and are available in the back. Um, we had for item 10D, one item of public comment. And for item 10E, um, post agenda, we distributed the track change versions of the actual um, memoranda of understanding. Wonderful. Um, are there any additions to the agenda or deletions? Staff has no changes. Very good. We'll move on to public comments. This is a time when any from the, anyone from the public can address the council on items that are not on this evening's agenda. If it's an agenda item, wait for that agenda item. If not, come and talk to us. Welcome. My name is John Liebram. I live at Brookville Terrace Mobile Home Park in Capitola. I uh, recently, re I've been there 21 years. I recently replaced my old mobile home with a brand new unit in December. I feel really good about that. I also um, had solar panels put on it, the first one in my park. My most recent bill was for $3.45. Um, I'm concerned about global warming. I've been concerned about global warming for a long time. Uh, for a long time, it seemed like there was just nothing to be done about it. Then I came across a uh, YouTube video uh, by a guy by the name of Dan Miller did this video talking about carbon fee and dividend, and uh, I got really excited. It seemed like this is something that could really make a difference. So after watching that video, I went on to Google and entered a uh, carbon fee and dividend, a group called Citizens Climate Lobby popped up, and they're working to get legislation passed to do that very thing, this uh, carbon fee and dividend. They're a national group, and they also have a local chapter, so I joined the local chapter. Uh, there's not enough time to explain uh, what carbon fee and dividend is right here, but I thought I'd send you guys a link, and in that link, uh, the Dan Miller link, he kind of explains what it's all about. Uh, some friends of mine from Citizens Climate Lobby are, are here with me uh, to talk about this some more and uh, also explain why we're here talking to you about this. So that's what I had. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Linda Marin, and like John, I'm a member of Citizens Climate Lobby, Santa Cruz chapter, um, and I want to give a little context for what John just reported on. Um, we are uh, an organization aiming to uh, create the political will for a livable planet, and uh, we have a single solution. We're nonpartisan, we're, uh, we're organized around lobbying for the single solution, which is carbon fee and dividend. Um, and to be very short on that, uh, it has three components. One, put a steadily rising price on carbon, return all of the revenue to households equally, everybody gets the same amount back, and put a border adjustment to not uh, disadvantage business um, and also to, uh, to discourage offshoring. So 
you might wonder, well, what does this have to do with the city of Capitola? And um, in the void of our having our federal, um, um, the, the United States having uh, removed itself from the Paris Climate Agreement, uh, cities and municipalities all over the United States are stepping up. And uh, I want to acknowledge that Capitola has uh, a climate action plan, and that's laudable. And um, while that is wonderful and necessary, we still need to keep pressuring our federal government for a national solution to climate change and to uh, global greenhouse gas emissions. So um, what we do is get endorsements wherever we can. Um, we're very pleased that the city of Santa Cruz and the county of Santa Cruz have signed a carbon fee and dividend resolution, and we're hoping for more of those because, as you can imagine, I'm sure you know, uh, our legislator, Jimmy Panetta, the first thing he wants to know when we talk with him is, well, who's supporting this? So uh, it, it th the more support we can show, the more uh, wind under his wings um, he has to propose and or um, support uh, or co-sponsor this kind of legislation. And even though that might sound like, oh, it'll never happen now, actually, we're closer to that than ever. It's a bipartisan solution, and it has uh, a tremendous amount of support from scientists, from economists, um, and from both parties. So that's an unusual kind of benefit <laughs> of this solution. So I am here tonight with packets for you, if you would like. Um, our normal approach is to talk with each council member individually and go through the packet and make sure that we answer any of the questions that might come up for you. Uh, but I'm happy to leave you with these packets and, and follow up. Uh, we can meet a little later after you've had a chance to read them, or even if you don't get a chance to read them, we can walk through them with you. Thank you. If you can give the packets to the city clerk, okay. and she'll distribute them. Okay. Thank you. Minus one, because we have... Pardon me? Minus one, because I got one from my... Oh, you have one. All right. All right, we can take that. Thank you. Thank you, both, Thank you. all of you. Greetings, Ray. How you doing? Hey, you know my name. Interesting. <laughs> oh, I think Ray we Cassino, I think CEO we for the for the thousands of people on TV. We all know Ray your Cassino, name. Ray CEO, uh, yes. Community Bridges. You're a part of uh, pop culture. Uh, <laughs> apparently. Uh, well, I actually just wanted to come up here, take the opportunity, since you are all here, uh, and there isn't an event happening in Capitola, but there's two events happening this weekend that we're involved with, um, which is the Families uh, Together Belong Together uh, Marches, which is a national-wide movement. Um, and we're going to be having two in this community, one in Watsonville and one in Santa Cruz, uh, from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Um, even though there's an injunction um, from a, a, a great judge down in San Diego um, stopping the, the separation of families at this point in time, there's still about 2,500 families that are still separated, and um, there is no uh, action to reunify. Um, you know, this is a, a cause that anyone who has a child uh, can relate to um, and anyone that can really understand um, comparing criminalization of someone crossing an imaginary line to someone breaking a law um, is uh, a little irrational. Um, so as uh, our organization, we're really hoping that at least people come and show uh, solidarity for more compassionate resolution, uh, an opportunity for us to discuss uh, immigration policy at, at a more uh, empathetic way. And we hope that uh, if you have an opportunity between 10 uh, and 12 that you join us uh, in a walk and a march uh, across either one of your selected uh, jurisdictions. So thank you so much. Thank you. Next. Good evening, honorable members of the city council. Um, thank you for what you do for this community and be happy you're not on the Santa Cruz city council. Oh, we are. <laughs> <laughs> um, y if you drive through um, through Depot Hill, the Jewel Box, right after sunset, you can kind of get a reading to what's happening up in those communities up there. I would say that the j the that Depot Hill today is probably two thirds empty, and um, just by looking at the lights on the neighborhood, you get a pretty good idea of which which houses are vacant and what's what's happening. It's not those aren't the only areas anywhere that surrounds the village or is in walking distance to the beach, it seems to be happening that way. And, and uh, 
we're seeing a major shift in population in our community. And, um, and it's come that people who live in Capitola or Santa Cruz County cannot afford to compete in the housing market in this area. Everything that uh, comes on the market today is bought from someone from out of town. I'm, I'm not saying those are bad people, not at all. But what happens is, um, is our town is fastly becoming a second home community for Silicon Valley. Uh, again, they're, they're good people, there's nothing wrong with them. The difference is, is most of them are wealthy enough not to have to rent their house out. This is changing complexity because the second homes before were all homes that they had rent out to people and create rentals. Today, they're not renting them out. They're staying vacant. So they're only, they're only here part of the year. And what happens with that is um, they don't, they don't play, pay into local sales taxes, or very little. Um, they don't participate in local government or a community. Um, and and, and for say that the, the neighborhoods are actually less safe because the safest neighborhoods are neighborhoods where you have eyes on the street. And that includes knowing and seeing and your neighbors looking down on your community. And so we have a, we have a change in, in demography, but also a change in, in, in culture within our, in Capitola. And I, I, would, I would be, I think I would be safe to say that the voter rolls in Capitola are 10% less this year than they were two years ago because those aren't registered voters. Those are people who are coming in and buying and, and keeping homes. Um, you, you know, I, I, I've always liked the idea that people who come before this council with problems also have solutions to those problems when they come up here. I don't, honestly, I don't have a solution to this. It's just something that we have as a community have to be aware of. And, uh, and so it brings me a little more discussion about affordable housing in this community. And um, the only answer that we have to affordable housing is ADUs or accessory units. There's very little opportunity for multiples, some along the commercial co corridors. There's no more vacant lots in Capitola, or very few. Um, we are, we're way too restrictive for our land use policies regarding ADUs. It's too expensive, too time consuming, and too restrictive. It, it's time for the city to find a path for affordable housing in our community. And many jurisdictions are in this process, including the county and city of Santa Cruz, um, who, who are act actively do taking on ADUs as a secondary home is issue. Um, the, the, this issue should be taken up by the council and, 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 you know, and your council on the issue with the water department and servicing these people. They're harming our community by their policy of requiring separate water meters for, for ADUs. It wasn't done before, it hurt them none, and it can be go back to that. Hopefully, if, if you can't take action with the state of California will. Um, if, the, if the city really, really cares about this community's affordability and keeping Capitola people here, um, it, it's, now's a good time. This year would be a good time to requisition a, a study on housing needs and solutions, including ADUs. Look at, look at all the avenues, but you need professional people to look at it and look at the demographics and what is happening, what are the change are changes happening here and believe me it, it would be a great investment for this city and and some examples of what's happening out there is some some jurisdiction some one minute um some jurisdictions are going down to three thousand square foot for for um uh, allowing for a uh, adu lot and, and think about capitola only probably one quarter of the lots in this whole city are over four thousand square feet which is your requirement you've already restricted it to only one quarter of the oh. One quarter of the city. Um, <coughs> I, I just think that it's time for the city to be proactive on this, and and that um, another thing that that could be looked at along with this is um, look at look at the idea of giving amnesty to people who have secondary units behind their house. Now, I, I would bet there's 40 of them in in, in uh, Riverview Terrace, and people live, and they're living there. The problem is, is they can't, they can't fix it up. They can't clean them up. They're not to code. There's no co the code enforcement because you don't make issue of it. People are living there. Give them amnesty if they'll create a, a, a unit that's livable and the fact that they, they need one of, the, one of the process, they would bring it up to code and make it safer for the people who are living there. Thank you, Dennis. That's it, thank you. Anyone else? If not, we'll move on to staff comments. Mr. Treasurer, do you have anything for us? Uh, there's just one uh, item that I thought was interesting uh, in terms of a major expense. Our Caterpillar 926M wheel loader with the front end shovel 
cost one hundred and ninety thousand dollars. What a bargain! That's a bargain. And I guess that means uh, that maintaining a beach paradise ain't cheap. No, it ain't. <coughs> and we don't buy one of those every day, <laughs> fortunately. <laughs> Staff, any comments? Just two very quick notes. First, I will let you know that today the CBRT measure. Uh, that you recall was the measure that we've opposed as a city, which was going to put on the November ballot in an effort to increase the threshold for local taxes to pass, was removed um, through a compromise with the legislature, uh, which effectively outlaws soda taxes for the next 10 years. Um, but that measure won't be on the ballot in November. Secondarily, just wanted to announce, as you've heard many times from me before, uh, Monterey Bay Community Power is going to be delivering carbon free power to residents in our fair city on July 2nd. And we did a lights on ceremony today down at the courthouse. And so everyone's very excited about that. Thank you. And two other items. Last night we held um, in conjunction with the uh, city, or excuse me, city clerk along with the county held a candidate's night uh, for both city council and other districts. We had about uh, a dozen people in attendance, about four of whom were interested in um, running for City Council, so we're, we're pleased. Um, and nomination period begins July 16th, so the 16th through August 10th is the time to pull nomination papers. The second item is that um, at that same meeting, I received notice from the Registrar of Voters that the initiative, the Citizens Initiative, has been certified. Um, there are ample signatures from voters on the petition, so we will be bringing that item forth at the July 26th meeting. Thank you. We'll now we'll go on to City Council comments. Stephanie, you have anything for us? Nothing? Thank you. Jock? Uh, I'd like to comment on what I thought was a very well-run um, community meeting last night. Uh, Steve Jesper put it on in conjunction with our consultant, and um, it was well uh, attended at the community center off of Jade Street. Um, a lot of really good comments. Um, I think uh, the neighbors really did put uh, a lot of thought into how to solve the problems. Um, also noticed that uh, people were very respectful of each other's comments. Um, got excited because, you know, they're really involved, but I just um, felt great to be in a community that had that kind of response to a common problem. I'd also like to say that um, I appreciate the Citizens Climate Group coming. Um, I think it's definitely an issue that I hope we could put on the agenda. And um, Dennis Norton's uh, comments I fully subscribe to. Um, this community of Capitola, um, in a way, has to think about our future. If, if it is going to go the way of vacant homes, um, the police chief will tell you that this is not safe. Um, I know from my neighbors, uh, they don't know who lives there, they don't know when they're there, um, and so it's not safe for the people who immediately live around it. Um, ADUs is a partial solution. A lot of my neighbors have people living in their homes already uh, for a whole variety of reasons, and I don't question what those reasons are, but um, in a sense, it's infill. ADUs is a way that you could do incremental infill. The people who put ADUs on their property are your neighbors already, and they want, if they're going to rent to someone else. Excuse me, Mr. Mayor, point of order. We, ADUs is not on our agenda. I, I know. These are council things. comments, and I'm going to give uh, Council Member Tran another minute to wrap okay. this up. Okay. So, Okay, I'll respect that and just cut it. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm not arguing about it one way or the other, but I just want to give, I, I want people to start thinking about what ADUs would mean to you in your own community, if a neighbor had one. Okay, so what I'm trying to suggest is that when your neighbor rents to someone, if it's an ADU, or they do a reverse because the one who owns the property now goes in the back, like a granny, or that kind of thing, and then rents to someone else for their larger house. These are people that are going to be your neighbors that you're going to feel comfortable more than likely because someone owns that property is making that decision with you in mind. Thank you, Councilmember Bertrand. Councilmember. Yes, just quickly. Uh, I also uh, would like to thank uh, Dennis Norton for your comments about affordable housing. I think it's incredibly important, and we need to um, put some time and effort into thinking about that as we move forward. Uh, and I will also uh, quickly say that I attended the League of California Cities Executive Forums uh, yesterday and today. And one of the uh, forums that I was in this afternoon was called uh, Cannabis in Your City. So I will uh, touch on what I learned there uh, later on in our agenda tonight. And that's all I have. Great. Thank you. I have nothing. Nothing. I have nothing either. 
What a so, well, what a moment. We'll go on to boards, commissions, and committee appointments. I believe we have a Regional Transportation Commission Bicycle Advisory Committee appointment. Yes, we do. Um, the applicant is unable to attend this evening, but you have his information in the packet. It is Michael Moore. He has represented us in years past. Um, he is the manager of the bicycle trip mm -hmm. and um, I believe our RTC representative uh, is supporting this nomination. So it is a recommendation to the RTC to make this appointment. Is there a motion? Yeah, I so move. I'd also like to mention that I did talk with him. He's very enthusiastic about being on this. Good. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Mr. Moore is on. We'll now go on to the consent calendar. These are all items taken as a single vote. Unless there is an item on the consent calendar someone would like to pull. I have a question about uh, 9G. G? And maybe clarify with the city clerk. Yes. I, in the language it says that uh, the election is to coincide with the presidential election in 2018. I just wonder why the language says presidential election. It, um, National? Can, you can adjust it. It is um, the statewide election. So we w we can make that adjustment. Yeah, it's mentioned a few version. times in the in the resolution and in the document. It says presidential election. I just didn't understand what that was in there. Was for. that just wishful thinking, or I think it was uh, reusing sure. a template. <laughs> okay, good. good. Okay, thank you. Just want to make that correct. We'll okay. correct that. We will correct in the. Anyone else like to pull any items? Move approval of the. Wait one moment. Anyone from the public see an item on consent they'd like to pull and discuss? Seeing none. Stephanie. Move approval of the consent calendar. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That is unanimous. We'll move on to general government hearings. First item is consideration of the budget and capital improvement program for the city of Capitola, fiscal year 2018-19. Staff. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, council members. So as you mentioned, this is the uh, third public hearing that we've had for this. Um, in addition, the Finance Advisory Committee has met three times as well to go over the budget. And I'm just going to give a brief summary of how we got to where we are today. Um, so as, as you've heard before, the local economy is re pretty stable, but our major revenue sources are starting to slow down. Um, the budget that's before you today is status quo. There's no real major changes, no um, new positions, no new revenue sources. Uh, our CalPERS costs still are the biggest threat to our city resources, and in addition, we have a heavy reliance on sales tax and our sales tax numbers the last two quarters have been a little bit low which has caused us through these budget hearings to reduce our revenue projections going forward. Um, in the budget also is balanced. We're estimating a ending fund balance of at fiscal year 19 of 990,000, a little bit higher than what we had at the last hearing and I'll, I'll go through how that got there. Um, also the reserves are fully funded, both the contingency and emergency reserves are funded and um, we're actually not even contributing to those because they're completely funded. And this will be our first full year of Measure F revenue as well as SB1, the um, transportation revenue coming in. So some changes, our last budget hearing was on May 30th, so I have a list of changes up there. The first two items up there are really just kind of true ups to um, tying back to audited numbers in prior years. They impacted our fund balance a little bit. Um, also, we in the finance department staff, we went through all of the year in estimates. We have more da data now than the first time I went through this and we were able to cut our expenses by about 120, our estimates by about 127,000, which helps out the fund balance. Um, changes to the budget that you're considering today is um, an increase in expenditures of just under 12,000. The majority of that is tied to our animal services contract. So we had a preliminary budget that came out earlier in the year. They've now um, adopted their budget and that that was where they landed the other minor change was to our liability insurance again that was a draft number that we had earlier and that's the adopted budget those changes will carry into next year and be offset by we found one uh, calculation error in our personnel costs in 1920. so from a general fund from the summary standpoint um, again it's a balanced budget revenues are exceeding expenditures by roughly eleven thousand dollars our estimated year in fund balance for this year that we're in that ends this week is now 979,000, so a little bit higher than our last budget hearing. And our projected year in fund balance and the general fund for this budget that you're considering tonight is 990,000. So capital projects, we have um, 
the first three up there are Measure F funded projects, the Wharf, Flume, and Jetty projects. Those are all funded with Measure F revenues. And then we also have the Bromer Street project, which is funded with some grant rev money that we received um, just a little bit or got authorized for a little, few weeks ago. And then the RTC Measure D money is also going to be contributing to that project. And then on the SB1 money, we're going to put that money towards 42nd and Diamond neighborhood paving. So those are our new projects. I don't have the library up there. As you're all well aware, the bids, construction bids came in way over budget, and there's going to be an update on that in a couple of items after this. Um, ongoing projects, so you can see our capital project program is really busy this year. There's a number of projects up there in various states of completion that um, our public works crews and everybody will be working on this year, so that's really busy still on the capital project side. Um, just to bring this back up again, our proposed budget work plan, so we have five items that were kind of key that we wanted to look at. The first one obviously being the PERS costs and staff developing some options for council consideration. Um, we have the uh, cannabis item on the agenda as well tonight, so completing that regulatory framework. Uh, Police Department is uh, going to be working on implementing that new neighborhood watch program. And then uh, we also have getting certification of the zoning code from the Coastal Commission and continue working with the mall ownership on redevelopment of the mall. So recommended action tonight is to approve the resolution adopting the fiscal year 1819 city budget and capital improvement program. And that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions of staff? Seeing none, I'll open this up to the public. Anyone who would like to comment on this item, please step forward. Ray Cantino, Community Bridges CEO. Um, so I think the, uh, you hit the nail on the head. Pension costs are, are a rising uh, issue. And so um, what I'm here is just making sure that uh, we all work together and we support Jamie uh, to go up to the state and, and really talk about pension reform, really talk about pension costs and send letters as a city uh, to ensure that we're trying to address it. I've talked uh, to some of you about these issues. Uh, when 50%, you know, when we start climbing to 50% of people are, that are receiving pensions are taking up the majority of the general fund and you only have 50% left to do the rest of the city services, it becomes really, really difficult and challenging. And so I think there needs to be a conversation about what to do moving forward. Um, we know that one side of it is increased revenues, increased uh, sales tax, increased uh, you know, marijuana framework and, and, and that component. That's gonna get you only so far. So um, I know that this is a little bit off topic in the sense of uh, what you're funding, um, but I wanted to make sure that uh, this continues beyond today's uh, action and then moves forward. Um, in any way possible. And as always, thank you so much, City Capitola, for your investment in social services and upstream investments and prevention. Uh, you guys are, are really uh, leading the charge and really understand um, how those investments uh, really pay off in the long term uh, so services continue across the county. So thank you. Thank you, Ray. I'll bring it back to the council. Start with Ed. Um, I'm ready to make a motion to approve staff. We're ready to hear it. A motion to approve staff recommendation on the budget. Is there a second? Second. Under discussion, anyone have any comments? Seeing none, I'll have a roll call vote on this. Council Member Harlan? Aye. Council Member Petrand? Aye. Council Member Peterson? Aye. Council Member Botorf? Aye. And Mayor Germany? Aye, right, it's unanimous, thank you. We'll move on to a review options for potential ballot measures for November 2018 general election. Um, our action tonight is to provide direction to staff regarding which items to put on the November 18 general election ballot staff. Mr. Mayor, members of the council. So as you recall, earlier this spring, we talked about a community polling contract to potentially test community sentiment about some potential items for the November ballot. At that time, council decided not to proceed with a poll, uh, but directed staff to return for further discussion about potential ballot items, specifically cannabis tax, a possible TOT measure, and potential measure to transition the treasurer from an elected position to an appointed position. As we've discussed several times, uh, cannabis tax have been approved by both voters in the city of Santa Cruz and the city, the county. Um, they are both set at a not to exceed 10% amount which is established by ordinance currently in the county at seven and in the city of Santa Cruz at 8%. Um, based on rough estimates, depending obviously on the scale of the operation and on the ultimate tax, should we approve, uh, 
put one on the ballot and have it approved by voters. Staff estimates that each retail establishment could generate approximately two to three hundred thousand dollars. It's probably a conservative estimate, but it is it's it's probably our best number that we can put out there right now. Obviously, a tax would require voter approval. And then there's a separate item on tonight's ballot, uh, tonight's agenda to talk about the other regulatory pieces associated with cannabis, which would be the changes in land use and zoning and the chain, the licensing protocol um, that our community development director will be presenting for us. Um, TOT, uh, I think everyone knows our TOT is currently, this is our hotel tax, is currently at 10%. The county, the city of Santa Cruz, Watsonville are all at 11%. Scotts Valley is at 10% right now, and they're going to be considering a ballot item this November, I believe, to go to 11%. Uh, Watsonville will be discussing at a city council level in July whether they're going to put a TOT measure on their ballot. Um, by way of reference, each 1% of TOT currently generates a, about $155,000, and obviously a change in TOT would require voter approval. At the last time this came up, Councilmember Botorf indicated that he was speaking with some representatives from the BIA. Um, Ed, do you want have any details you want before we sort of dive into what you've given me? Sure, uh, just a little background just for the council. Most of us were here uh, in 2014, the history was we made an appeal to raise TOT tax, uh, I believe to 11%. And uh, at that time, you know, we didn't, we did polling, which I think polled out at 82%, felt that it was favorable. Uh, we met with strong opposition and it ended up being a, a non-memorable election for all of us. So um, this time, you know, TOT still uh, continues to be a major source of income for us and one that we all look at. Uh, so I went back to the drawing board. I've been meeting with local business members in the BIA, um, uh, members of the lodging community, and other uh, businessmen and restaurant owners to try to uh, come up with some kind of uh, compromise or bargain or way that we can get to a raise in TOT tax without having a uh, less than favorable campaign. And at this point, I uh, had a meeting, final meeting with them yesterday and reached a tentative agreement and I've given the city manager the details of that agreement and, and I'm hopeful that the city council will embrace that decision and uh, maybe we can move forward with putting a TOT measure on the ballot. So if the city manager wants to deal with those details. So these are the details. Um of the, the negotiation with the BIA. Essentially, it's a 2% increase to the TOT um, to take it from 10 to 12%. As proposed, it would be a 66% measure, so it would be a restricted tax. Um, so of the 2%, 0.4% of the TOT increase would be dedicated to local business groups. Uh, the proposal currently is that it would be split evenly between the BIA and the chamber. Um, based on the current TOT level, that's about $31,000 a year for each. Uh, the chamber funding in the general fund would be eliminated, which is currently $30,000 and has been in the, in the budget for a number of years. Um, the, the, the chamber would use the funding to increase city marketing efforts, and the BIA would use their funding to increase marketing and village enhancements. In addition, 0.35% of the TOT increase would be dedicated to youth, early childhood education type programs. Based on the current TOT level, that would take it, that would be about $54,000. Um, and the thought behind this is it would replace the community grant youth program funding, which is currently just under $50,000 um, in the most recent grant cycle. And then the remaining 1.25% of the TOT increase would go to the general fund, which is currently $194,000. So, that's a lot on one slide, and before I pivot off TOT, Mr. Mayor, would, would any council members want to ask any questions on this? Uh, just to be clear, um, not only does this bring almost 200000 into the general fund, it also funds two programs we fund already, but it gives them the ability to increase with the inevitable increase of TOT in our city. So should our overall TOT increase by 10%, we could see early childhood education going up by another five or $8,000. The same correct. would go to the BIA and the chamber, so they would be self-regulating. That, that's correct. It would be then, then tied to the TOT, so they would be receiving 0.35% and 0.4% of the TOT. So if we had a new hotel, if hotels were, our existing hotels were more successful, uh, they would share in that benefit. So the marketing effort of both the chamber and the BIA would be you know, self-enhancing 
creating more tourism, creating more TOT, thereby giving them more money ultimately to do the same thing. Just wanted to be clear. Any questions of staff? Let's move on to the next one. Okay. The next item is the city treasurer, and this one, our treasurer has prepared a presentation for you tonight that I will manage for him. Um, you're, no, you're, you're good from right there. You're right there. You're speaking as the city treasurer, so. Okay. See, you already missed the first slide. Oh, sorry, okay. <laughs> okay, so now next slide. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? It's gonna be like that, isn't it? Okay. So, uh, I wanted to talk to you ab about this in, in detail because I think it's important that you're all behind this because, um, uh, uh, you know, if I can't convince everybody in the city council that this is a good idea, I think it's going to be difficult to get this thing to pass because if you, having all the details in front of you, you don't think it's a good idea, maybe we shouldn't even ask the public to go for this. But So I, I think it is a good idea. I think it's clear it's a good idea. So, so let's get into those details. So two reasons why it's, uh, it's a good idea to get rid of the elected position of treasurer. And the first is it's unnecessary. I think you kind of know that we already have plenty of checks and balances and we already have a finance director to handle the day-to-day -day things. But I think most importantly, and the thing that's convinced me was that it's, it's a dangerous position because of the, the notion that we have conflicting charters that the state says one thing and our city says something a little bit different and that gives you an opportunity to create some confusion, um, create some, uh, chaos and potential power struggle. So let me go through both of those um, items in, in detail. First of all, oh, I'm sorry, next slide, are we on unnecessary? Yes, okay. So there's multiple avenues of financial oversight that already exist. All right, we, we already have an accounting department. I mean, I come up here and talk about invoices. Well, we already have lots of people looking at all, looking at all those invoices. Um, you know, the department heads, we've got the accountants, we've got the city manager signing off on all these. And uh, the notion of having a treasurer give it a cursory look is not that beneficial. Um, the financial advisory committee already has elected officials on it. So if you're thinking of a treasurer as, oh, well, let's have an elected official looking at or responsible for, for our finances. We already have two elected officials. There are the, the Financial Advisory Committee City Council members. Um, in addition, we have the three citizen appointees. So there, there's plenty of opportunity for independent oversight by the uh, City Council and the, the um, citizens at large to review our finances. Oh, one of the things I didn't mention here is, of course, we have open government. So all of our finances, and that's a software program. So our finances are available online. So if anybody wants to review where our budget is, what's going on, you, all they need to do is go onto our website and just you know, plow down through the um, financial website and all that information's there. So we're very open. There's no secrets here. Um, in addition, obviously we have professional auditors. VTK is our, is our auditor. They, we, I just saw their invoice the other day. And they are chartered to look for irregularities and fraud, basically. And they report out twice a year, not to the city manager, but to the city council. So they are a, another independent check. So one of the things they do is they specifically look at our procedures to make sure that we have internal controls or cross checks on um, all of our finances. So. You know, if we're thinking that the treasurer is, a, is, a, is an added benefit because we need the extra checks and balances, we've got lots of checks and balances. Next slide. Um, with regards to the other thing you would think a treasurer would do, which was provide the daily tasks of running the city finances, well, obviously we have a financial director who does that. In addition, he performs, uh, uh, puts out the quarterly reports. He supervises the accounting staff and he's a professional with a professional resume, not someone who just on a lark decided to run for an office and suddenly is potentially in charge of your finances. So the point is, is that why should we have an elected treasurer when you already have five elected council members available for, for financial oversight and two specifically assigned to the FAC and a professional appointee already on the job? So it's unnecessary. 
Next slide. It's dangerous. So let's go into this conflicting charter uh, issue. The Capitola is a, is a general law city governed by California government code. And section 41001 says the city treasurer shall receive and safely keep all money the treasurer receives. Well, we don't have the treasurer receive any money. So does that mean the treasurer has no responsibilities? Or, as some have interpreted it, does that mean that the treasurer is responsible for all the city money? And so that the treasurer is, in fact, the one who is responsible for all of your city finances. Well, I know that's not your intent, but it can be interpreted that way. Section 4106, next slide. The treasurer, city treasurer may appoint deputies. Well, this can easily be interpreted as that the finance director reports not to the city manager, but to, to, to the treasurer. So you have an elected treasurer who says, well, I'm not all that up on all this finances. Let me hire a deputy. I've got the finance director. He reports to me. So what does the Capitola Code say? Well, the Capitola Code defines the city manager as the administrative head of the government and is silent on the duties of treasurer. Why do we elect a treasurer when there is no assigned duties? Does that mean that treasurer has no responsibilities? Or does it, in fact, mean that the responsibilities default to the state code? In which case, as we've gone over, the treasurer has lots of responsibilities. So finally, next slide, a liberal, a liberal interpretation of the powers of the treasurer can and has been made. I'm not just making this up. This is a real conflict that has, in fact, happened in, in, the, in the past. It, it leads uh, to the potential of an activist treasurer who, regardless of whether their cause is just or their crusade is mighty, uh, creates conflicts that you don't want. Uh, it, con it con conflicts with the city manager, the daily operations, and what the city council has in mind and is detrimental to the operation of the city. So let's get rid of this potential conflict that is dangerous to our operations. Next slide, accountability. So someone in the role who is potentially legal accountable, legally, legally accountable, but yet in fact who has no authority in practice leads to legal risks and the lack of a tr a transparency. So if a problem should arise, it needs to be clear, a, a financial problem, it needs to be clear that the city manager's office is responsible and accountable and not the selected position of treasurer. We need to make that clear. And we need a well-defined chain of command. Finally, uh, it's dangerous because it gives unqualified applicants. I mean, the salary uh, for the treasurer is not, <laughs> $3,000 is not going to attract qualified professionals to run your finances for you. Um, in fact, there are few, if any, applicants when, when this office comes up for election. Why? What are the incentives? It's not a voting position, uh, and it has no official authority. There's no financial background required to be, to be a treasurer. So, so what is expected of the treasurer? Why do we insist on having one? It seems to be an unwanted stepchild, a, a vestigial tail. It, it, it just, it's not a good idea. So uh, finally, with no authority, what would happen if there was a, a lawsuit involving financial irregularities? Would that ensnare the treasurer? You would think so. So perhaps that's why no one wants to run for this office, because with no authority and all the responsibility, you've got nothing but trouble. So this office is just not structured to provide meaningful service. So next, next slide. So if we were to get rid of it, what's the precedent for doing such a thing? Well, it turns out we've done this already with the city clerk's office. So the tr city clerk's office, once upon a time, was an elected position. But there was an effort to turn it into an appointed position because you need a highly qualified professional uh, <laughs> To run this, to run that position, and the treasurer needs the same treatment for the same reason. So, are we breaking any new ground here? No. Most local cities have no elected treasurer. Uh, we're one of the few that does. Santa Cruz has no elected treasurer. Neither does Scotts Valley, Watsonville, Monterey, Pacific Grove, Carmel, Salinas, Gilroy. No treasures in all those cities. So, let's eliminate the waste of a salary, small as it is 
benefits, and most importantly, valuable staff time babysitting the treasure, <laughs> and, and get rid of it. So f final chart, I think, and this is why I, I want you to all be behind this, because I think the electorate is naturally suspicious of the government, and, and they're, they're not going to want to remove this office because they're unaware of these details, and they're going to easily see this as cheap insurance. Uh, sure, why not? Let's just have it. But you know now what the, why it's unnecessary and dangerous. So I think it's important that the entire city council get behind this initiative and eliminate any controversy, and, uh, and, and then we have a good chance of getting this thing passed. Thank you. How would, do you propose, do you propose that we eliminate the position of treasurer entirely? <laughs> um, it becomes an appointed position as opposed to an elected position, just like the city clerk. And who makes that appointment? It would be the city manager. It could be the city manager, it could be the city council. You could also, um, if the council wanted flexibility, uh, noting that the um, s number of cities don't have treasurers, you could give the council the authorization but not the obligation to appoint a treasurer. So if circumstances demanded it, you know, you could get together and appoint a city treasurer. But if things were running smoothly and you don't think circumstances warranted having one more person in the city's bureaucracy, so you'd say, uh, for example, city council may appoint a city treasurer um, in its sole discretion or something uh, of that nature. Any other, yes. Uh, could the city council appoint the finance director as treasurer? I think so. Uh, that's, that's, I think that happens. I think when in Santa Cruz where uh, there are requirements that a treasurer sign off on something, the city finance director does that. And so Any other questions of staff? No, thank you for that presentation. We'll open this up to the public. Would anyone like to speak on this subject? Seeing none. Oh, Ray. Well, you, you kind of went over the other topics, so I don't know. No, no, this is, I'm asking. We're going to circle back. I'm sorry, I need to circle back. back. Yeah. My, my apologies. Yeah. Uh, I wanted, I, we had a robust discussion. I was just going to normal. Let's go to the next item, please. Okay. Uh, so at this point, um, I would actually, I think the, the city treasurer went through these points, so I'm not going to. Excuse me. Um, this was just the polling that we did four years ago on it. So I think the city treasurer's points are well taken is that it's going to be tough to pass. It's going to require a united front in the campaign because <clears throat> even after um, people that were uh, subject to the poll were read information, it was about you know 43 in favor, 44 against. So it would really be contingent, I think, on strong support and strong campaign education effort. Thank you. Um, so really quickly, I'm just gonna talk about the process moving forward. So the final date to submit ballot measures uh, to the county for inclusion in the November ballot is August 10th. So what I'm hoping for tonight is as we get direction and we'll put them all up on the screen uh, for the items to place on the ballot on July 26th. And at that point, you could appoint a subcommittee potentially to author um, arguments in favor and then review those arguments on August 9th and authorize signers for those argument, arguments. So that would be the suggested process moving forward. So the recommendation is number one, determine a not to exceed level for the cannabis tax between eight and 10%, establish an initial cannabis tax in the six to eight range, and apply the cannabis tax to any cannabis business citywide, understanding that the current ordinance is only about retail sales in the CR zoning. And then direct staff to proceed with the TOT measure supported by the BIA, and then determine if placing a treasurer um, on the ballot, the treasure item on the ballot is appropriate at this time. When we, that, I'm available for questions. Any questions? When we bring this back to the council, and we can, we can put the not to exceed level for cannabis tax anywhere we wish. That's True. correct. Okay. Uh, when this comes back after public comment, I would like to take these one at a time. And I think we can discuss and vote on one at a time because a lot of complex issues. Anyone from the public? Ray, come on up. It's your time. Sorry to make you go back and forth. A little confused that there was going to be so many, but Ray Cancino, CEO, of Community Bridges. I'm glad I stayed, uh, or else I wouldn't have seen the proposal for TOT and the impacts that it has. I think it sends a really chilling and inappropriate message uh, when we are subsidizing um, the business uh, community um, uh, more than we are looking at, uh, you know, early childhood education. Um, I think that. Business councils are important. They're gonna be helpful in moving forward with sales tax, but I think it sends a really wrong message when you're supporting at a higher rate um, 
traditional things that are for uh, business um, at the expense or at a cost to uh, your needs that are, are in your general fund for public safety issues or your things that you might be considering like uh, prevention and early childhood education. So I just would be uh, really looking at how do we make that a little bit more equitable um, because there's just something uh, for me, uh, um, you know, uh, pri uh, subsidizing uh, private businesses and, and private enterprise um, seems a little bit off. So. Those are my comments. Thanks, Ray. Anyone else? Khalil, welcome. Hi, Khalil Mutawakil. I'm a CEO for Kind People's Collective. We're a cannabis dispensary in both the city of Santa Cruz and unincorporated Santa Cruz. I'm also a community member. I've been here my whole life, born and raised. A family man as well. Got two children, raised my family here. So it's a pleasure to meet all of your acquaintance. Uh, I'd like to uh, speak uh, hopefully twice tonight, once on the uh, ordinance um, that we'll hopefully be discussing after this and, and, and now on the tax issues. Um, so yes, cannabis uh, businesses are a sustainable funding source uh, for the city of Capitola. I'm happy to see the city um, taking this leap of faith along with the county and uh, city that have had successful programs for many years now. Um, recently in the cannabis industry, there have been some major changes as, as you might no, uh, January 1st of this year, uh, adult use cannabis uh, passed in the state of California. And there are a lot of upstream costs for uh, both businesses and, what that, uh, and, and consumers. And what that um, eventually means is a higher price to the consumer. And when you've got a high price to the consumer competing with the black market, you've got an issue. You've got folks uh, showing up to our locations every day saying, can you give me a discount? Um, I can call a delivery service online and have the same product delivered to my door for far cheaper. They're not taxed, they're very difficult to regulate. Uh, so we're hoping to keep that uh, tax rate at an appropriate level that can scale over time. State regulations are very expensive. There's child-proof packaging, there's new labeling requirements, there's manufacturing guidelines, there's a new 15% excise tax that gets charged at the register, and then there's licensing fees, which for our business are $120,000 annually, each location. Uh, a couple recommendations I'd like to uh, make in this final minute. Uh, in both the city and the county in uh, recent years, they've looked at the cannabis tax and said, hey, maybe we could use a portion of these proceeds towards some type of uh, deficient program uh, that, that, that may be beneficial for the community. And I'd like uh, the council to consider um, that now, because later on that will be much more difficult to pull off. The trend uh, statewide is a reduction of taxes. Uh, Oakland recently reduced their tax from 10% to 5%. Monterey just reduced theirs from 6% to 4%. Uh, other jurisdictions around the state, Santa Rosa, 3%, Sonoma, 2%, uh, Berkeley, Stockton, 5%, and in San Jose, uh, they're at 10%. Uh, the case in San Jose is a bit different. They have 16 dispensaries for much larger population. Santa Cruz County has the highest density per capita of retailers of anywhere in the state of California. We have additional dispensaries coming down the pipe in Watsonville. We've got three more dispensaries coming down uh, in the city of Santa Cruz. I'd also like to make the recommendation to be allowed to pass the tax through to the consumer. Currently in both the city and the county, we're not allowed to do that. So essentially what that creates is double taxation. You get a tax on the tax. Uh, so we'd like to be able to subtotal uh, a customer's uh, products and then pass that tax through. Uh, that'll make it a lot easier for us to, to um, accommodate that over time. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to address the council on any of these three items? Then I'd like to take the treasurer item first, discussion and vote. Yeah, I'll start. Uh, first of all, you know, I, I, I really appreciate that you took this position on for two years, attended every meeting, uh, fulfilled the duties of a treasurer, and came up with such a rational analysis of your position. Uh, I, I think that the position I felt last time when we did this that it, it, it had exceeded its, uh, it was no longer useful to the city to have that component. And I think that uh, the fact that you served in this position uh, as well as you did, uh, sometimes as treasurer and sixth council person, um, it, was, uh, it, was, it was really good to get an analysis. And I support your position uh, to remove that, and uh, I, I no longer see a need for it. So uh, I'd make a motion to uh, put on the ballot to uh, remove the position of treasurer. Is there a second for the purpose of discussion? 
Just to clarify, to remove it altogether, correct? Not as an elected? Yeah, I'll second that. Okay. For under discussion, Stephanie. Good ideas. I think good points. Yeah. Very good presentation. Thank you very much. Jock, anything to say about this? Uh, yeah, I don't like it. And I've been pretty vocal about that. Um, it's not part of the staff presentation, so it should have been in the docket as part of the staff presentation so that we would have been able to prepare comments in reference to what was presented by yourself. Uh, it was a good presentation. So one thing that um, I found out, I was treasurer here for four years, and I found out that um, people really liked the idea that there was an elected person who's a treasurer overlooking what was going on behind the scenes. It has nothing to do with the fact that we do or don't have qualified people who run our finance department. We do. We have excellent qualified people. Um, in fact, when um, another thing that comes to mind, for a while we didn't have an actual treasurer. I mean, excuse me, we didn't have an actual finance director. And I ran the fact, and I ran a lot of those meeting minutes and kept them and put them on file and stuff like that. So I jumped in where it was needed. I think the main, the main reason why an elected official is important, it is truly a figurehead position. You're absolutely right. But the public knows that they have a member of the public inside City Hall which we don't normally have. I live here. Okay. We have five city council people, but someone who's actually focused on the individual invoices, the individual payments, and that's what I did. I worked with the different people in the finance department, and I checked every single thing that came in and out. And sometimes I wouldn't actually sign the treasurer's report because I didn't agree with them. I followed the individual credit card reports and I talked to the people who actually made those payments, I mean, made those purchases. And that's what I did. And when people talked to me about what it was a treasure like, I told them that's what I did. And if you want to know that someone's there and you have a disagreement with what's happening because you read it in the, in the meeting minutes, you could ask me, and I'll, I'll trace it down for you. And actually, I did that <coughs> multiple times. So pursuant to what Kristen brought up, so, so implication, excuse me, implied, I have no problem with re-looking at the treasurer's position and making it consistent with maybe the realities of the position. But I definitely think that having an elected person from the city of Capitola that the citizens could actually talk to and who has the authority to drill down behind the scenes is a worthwhile position. Okay, and uh, I am fully in favor of your proposal. I've felt that way for a long time and I feel that we just don't get um, enough candidates running for election to treasure um, and we are, the public is not given a selection. They're given a, a single choice almost every election cycle. So um, we have a motion and a second. I'd like to bring this to a roll call vote. Stephanie. Oh, sorry, that's your no line. <laughs> <laughs> Councilmember Harlan. Aye. Councilmember Petran. No. Councilmember Peterson. Aye. Councilmember Botorf. Aye. And Mayor Termini. Aye. Well done, let's move on to the TOT measure as supported by the BIA. And uh, Stephanie, you want to start? What do you think of I'm, that? I'm in favor of it. I think it's, it's we, uh, I understand the point about giving money to businesses, but we've always given the chamber money. <laughs> Every year we give them money. And we, we don't, haven't been giving the BIA money. They just get, no. they just have their dues that, from their members. And, and I might add that, that the, the 49,000 in, in grants that we give to youth programs is by far not the sum total of what we contribute to youth in this community. It is many times that. That is just single line items to organizations outside the city. So I will. I do not put business ahead of the children, sincerely. Um, I'm thinking of this as more of a stable funding that cannot get touched by voter approval, and it's solid, and it grows with the community, and we do more and more each year. 
So, and, and, I, and I respect Ray's um, opinions on all matters of this type. So I just wanted to respond to that. Um, anybody interested in, get Ed, you go next. I have a comment, yeah. I, I just want to respond to that comment because I want to make it clear that the city of Capitola gives $275,000 to community grants. Um, the money that we gave to the chamber was $30,000 and the new money to the, the BIA is another $30,000. Keep in mind that this measure was put on the ballot two years ago and it failed. And if it fails, that means there's no additional revenue. The, the fact that we're in agreement with the business owners and the lodging owners that this could generate it approximately $310,000 annually for the city of Capitola and to give 10% uh, each one of those businesses. And when I say give, I, I use that term loosely because we're not giving it to them, we're investing in them because they're gonna use this money to market their lodging, their hotels, their facilities. And if that means that they can increase their occupancy rate from low 80s to maybe high 90s, then that would increase our TOT from an annual of 155,000 for every 1% to maybe a higher number. So I don't want to look at it as giving them money. I'm investing in them and investing in the city of Capitola. And the, and the one thing that's here that's never been within any organization in, in community grants is that for the first time education is going to be part of TOT, which over the past five years has shown a year over year growth of 5%. And so to tie our educational fund, I'm pretty proud of the fact that, that we're going to, we stand for education. We've included it in this program, and it's going to continue to grow along with the investments for business. And in the words of the business committee, I thought this was totally a win-win situation, so I stand behind this 100%. I support going to 12% also, but <coughs> if we're going to do this, let's just not do it for 1%. Let's oh, it's for 12. Yeah. yeah. It's 12. For 12. yeah. yeah. Anyone else have a comment on this item? Then I'd like to say I wish this was part of the staff uh, report that was included in our agenda because I did not get this. So this is the first time I've heard it. Uh, I have to apologize, Jacques. This meeting was yesterday afternoon, uh, and this I got the information to the city manager as soon as possible. I had given some kind of a preclude that I would be trying to make a presentation tonight. City manager rapidly took this information, assembled it into a slide, which was better than me hand giving you handouts. So there was no deceit in that. It was just a meeting to get these people together. The meeting was yesterday. Okay, I'm, I'm not saying there's deceit, yeah. but I had no chance to prepare for this. Um, I see why it was done, and I understand that it would probably took quite a bit of work to do it. So I'll support it, but I do have some issues with it, and I just didn't have proper time to prepare for it. Is there a motion? Motion to approve uh, putting the TOT on the ballot at 12%. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It's unanimous. Now, on to cannabis. I'd live to say that at a meeting as an elected official. Go ahead. No. <laughs> let's delve, let's get into cannabis now. Uh, discussion? Anyone? Was, well, is there a decision we need to make here? Well, it, is it, the decision is... Is it, is it um, sufficient to leave it in the six to eight range, or are you looking for a number? Uh, so, the, as written by the city of Santa Cruz and the county, is the ordinance that the voters approved set the ceiling? And then the council, the city council or the board of supervisors established the actual level below that ceiling. So what we would like to know at this stage would be what is the ceiling and what would we be setting it at initially, uh, just so we can prepare the ordinance and the resolution for the July 26th meeting um, So to put it on the ballot. Just to, this is just a, a movement to put it on the ballot, and so we're going to set the ceiling. And we're going to set the initial rate. Yeah, and you don't have to set the initial rate right now. But we um, have to set the ceiling. We, we, I mean, we could punt and we could have it on the 26th with sort of a placeholder for that. But my recommendation is no, pick let's, a number now. Let's do it now. And I just like to make a pitch for making it lower than we might feel just because we know that's the trend. And I would say the ceiling being somewhere between 6 and 8 rather than 8 and 10. 10 is not working for anybody. We don't want to kill the golden goose. And we also don't want to drive it into um, into black market. And at the same time, I would rather not give future councils the ability to drive all cannabis retail out of the city by virtue of increasing the tax to an inordinate percentage. And I think that's a very valid point. And that's why my reservation is, is that the existing rate in the county, if I'm not mistaken, 
I'm, I'm jumping to the set number two item is 7%. And the existing rate in Santa Cruz is 7% with their 1% educational ad addition. So the, the to, I, I don't feel like I want to get into a bidding war with the county in Santa Cruz over the location. So um, <clears throat> I understand the appreciation of the point that was made about what the percentage is, but because it's been determined at 7%, I would be willing to say that I would like to see an initial range of 7% only to be consistent with those other agencies. What you set the upper limit at could be the same as far as I'm concerned. I mean, it could be the top could be seven and it could be at seven if that's legal to do that. But right now for me to say, interpret the language about this going lower, if I set this at 3%, then what I'm bringing no. is all that traffic, all that congestion, all that incident in right. the Capitol and we start this bidding war in the county, which I would not like to be part of. Agreed, and is that a motion for seven and seven? A motion would be to set the upper limit. Uh, can I do them at both the same number? Is that legal to do that? I would set the upper limit at 7% and the, the current range at 7%. Current rate. Is there a second? Second. second. Several seconds. Any further discussion? Well, All I know that many jurisdictions are looking at lowering their, right. their fees because- we, we can do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I would almost start at six. Well, than seven. well I think seven's a good, um, I, I feel seven's a good compromise and it keeps it from going to 10, which would kill it. Right. And it also allows us to go to four or three future councils, depending on what the market is showing. Just for clarification, the city council can change this number at any time to lower it. Right, you just can't go above. Stephanie, I, I agree with you, and, and, and if the trend is that this is not working and it's handcuffing it and it's, in, in, it's, it's influencing the, bl the black market and we learn that, we can come back here and modify that instantly. But right now, I think being consistent with our fellow cities and counties is what's important. So um, we have a, a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you very much. And I think we've moved through all three ballot items. Mm -hmm. And we'll move on to um, update on the Capitola Branch Library construction bids. And we are only receiving a report tonight. We are not, we're doing nothing else, correct? That is correct. No council action. Yeah. Then Steve, report <laughs> on. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I, I do apologize for sounding like a Brickman record. I think you're gonna, <laughs> same report you got last week, but uh, our last council meeting. Um, as quick background, we got a low bid of $12.35 million uh, was received on June 8th. And as you all know, our current construction budget is $9.9 .9 million, putting us slightly over budget here on the construction project. Um, currently on the cost side, uh, we've gone through some value engineering uh, exercises with the team and we've identified uh, a, estimated $1.5 million in savings that we can make. These aren't just random savings, they're, they're meaningful changes to, uh, to the uh, design and, and way things are getting built, electrical, HVAC, uh, but they will not uh, impact the, the uh, programs and the, and the library itself. Um, this estimate's still being verified. We're, we're trying to work with the architect and the other team members to uh, verify these cost savings and we're also looking for additional savings um, trying to keep going on the funding side uh, there has been additional measure s revenue has exceeded its original estimates at this point so the library jpa has formed a subcommittee to evaluate uh, what to do with this funding and i think the city manager is going to provide us an update on that so as steve mentioned the jpa formed a subcommittee comprised of myself and the county cao to look into the excess measure s revenues so by way of explanation what that means is is there's a measure s was a 49 dollar a parcel tax and there was an estimate of how much that was going to generate each year and then this also associated with that was an assumption of how much bonding we were going to do under measure s to build the libraries and what the interest rates were going to be well, we beat the interest rate on the first bond issuance, and on top of that, the $49 um, a year tax generates more than was anticipated. And so when uh, CAO Palacios and myself met this morning, we took a look at how much additional funding Measure S may have and what it would take to release it to the projects. And I will say that the CAO appreciates the conundrum we're in, that we need to move quite quickly 
um, and also appreciates the fact that if there's additional Measure S revenue that can be brought to bear to help projects that it should, should be done rather than leaving money on the table and not building the projects that you could, um, it's going to be a timing question. And at the end of the day, the amount that each jurisdiction gets is specified in the JPA document that each jurisdiction adopted. So if there is additional Measure S revenue, very likely it would be distributed through that JPA, through that same formula, and it would require ratification by all the city councils. So I'm encouraged by the conversation. Um, it'll probably take a little time to fully develop. And by July 26, I think we'll have a much better feeling for where that's going uh, when we bring this back to you next time. Questions of staff? So, Anyone? I will open this up to the public. Anyone who would like to come up and speak on this item? Everybody's welcome. Sure. Do I sign in? I guess I do. You can speak first and then sign in or sign in and then speak. It's all yours. My name is Joe Palandrani. Uh, I'm here with my wife, Mara, and we live at uh, in, in Capitola. We've mm -hmm. lived there since 2001. And in 2006, we moved our business here so we could help Capitola grow with our tax income, et cetera. And I'm, I'm puzzled why I'm, I'm here right now, to be honest with you, because with the pressing issues you have with your budget and the 15-minute presentation I heard about all the tax overview, or the, all the budget overviews and checks and balances, why are we building such a large library? It's over budget. And I think it's it's a burden on on the city. And I, I think that the the city should rethink it, come up with a, a proposal within the budget that would meet the community's needs. That's all I have to say. That's good. Thanks, Joe. T.J. T.J. Welch and uh, Joe uh, kind of touched on a lot of subjects, but. Um, hey, I want to build a library. I'm excited about building a new library. I just want it to be realistic, and uh, and I want us as a group to be responsible in doing that. You know, uh, I got to tell you, sitting through listening to uh, individuals talk about uh, saving money from pensions in order to give more to social programs doesn't sit real easy with me. Um, in fact, I'd like to talk to you, some any of you that want to talk about uh, PERS unfunded liability, OPEB, I'd be more than happy to sit down and talk to you. But the reason why we have unfunded liability and OPEB issues is because primarily politicians kick the can down the road and they didn't pay up front when they needed to pay and they've waited and do costs increase? Yeah, we just saw this with the library. So we've put all these employer uh, employee expenses down the road and they've increased over the years and we find ourselves in debt. In fact, to help support fund this library, you as city council members have approved uh, one of your $480,000 PERS reimbursement checks to go towards that. Um, to me, I think this is just, let's, let's just rethink this thing. Let's make an appropriate size library, a beautiful library that fits within our, our needs. I'm glad to hear Jamie talk about major S. Yeah, if more money comes back, then that's great for us and maybe we can help fund uh, some of the staffing and some of the other things at the library. But taking money out of the general fund, taking money from, uh, especially from our PERS, which is already, what are we like, 20 million plus in debt to PERS? And we're taking PERS checks and putting it towards the library, which um, maybe serves a portion of our public is a little bit beyond, uh, um, I think, anything that's responsible. So let's redesign it, make it an appropriate size, make it a, within the budget, not spend this extra um, general fund money, not spend our PERS money, and if we have that kind of money, then we can pay off our PERS debt and get out of this uh, this black cloud. Thank you. Next. Welcome. My name is Mark Kane. I'm a resident of Capitola. And um, thank you, Council, Mr. Mayor, staff. I'm here to talk about the library. And I, I mirror what, uh, echo what these other two speakers said in that I think it's irresponsible the way things are going now to continue. Uh, I'm currently uh, in a construction job in the city and uh, prices are unbelievable. And uh, I think that the uh, 
the overbid, the overprice on this stuff is uh, the library is going to go higher and higher. And then um, you mentioned in your budget about the revenue sources slowing. Um, I don't know. I was taught that if I don't have the money, uh, don't spend it. If you don't have it, there's revenue sources that can be. Um, th you mentioned uh, the mall at 41st Avenue. There's the uh, where the theater was downtown here in, in Capitola. Uh, there, there could be annexation of the end of uh, 41st Avenue, um, and then you f then you can spend money on these projects. Uh, how about taking the city hall and the police department and putting it on the side of the library? Uh, I, I think there's a there's a bluff on uh, Depot Hill. I don't know why you need a study. A foot falls off every year. I talked to a person who's uh, currently uh, in the permit process here, and uh, the city is requiring him, anybody within 200 feet of the bluff, to come up with a 50-year geological plan. I mean, the city doesn't even have a plan for the bluff. And that uh, the uh, wharf, unbelievable what that's going to cost in overruns. Um, numbers make liars, and liars make numbers. I think this is all... Um, come down to you either got the money or you don't and there's a place for us to get the money and I know there's some uh, work on trying to uh, access that and maybe speed up uh, development but man I think that's where the focus should be and thank you anyone else <clears throat> I'll bring it back to the council and if I can jump ahead because I've been in more meetings than I care to talk about with regarding the library to make it clear to everyone and, and I respect everyone who spoke tonight. Let me clarify a few points. Three quarters of this county voted for Measure S, and the only thing we can use that money for is to build libraries. That's what the bond was for. That's what they voted on. Well over two thirds, almost three quarters of the county residents voted to do that. We are doing just that. We are also not letting out a contract that's over budget, but rather coming back many times to make the library be within the budget. So we are doing that exact thing. We can't take the $9 million to the library and give it to PERS. We cannot. Despite the fine retired people that I know and love who might be in favor of that. Um, it's, we are, we are going as cautiously and as responsibly as we can. With regard to the right size library, the studies that were done say that our library is 2,000 square feet undersized. We didn't go there. We went with one we felt we could budget and afford. And we're still moving in that direction. Nobody here is going to take any more money out of the general fund to fund an over-budgeted library. Or I should say an underfunded library. Uh, we have taken money out of the general fund to meet this budget. A, a one-time cost. PERS goes on forever. And every time we pay off an unfunded liability, we get another $30 million bill from the state. We are not the problem on that one. Someone needs to talk to PERS and find out why they can only return 2% on your investment when any half-baked you know, financial advisor can get you eight. So this is a bigger problem that we can solve here. But believe me, this is not an irresponsible action. It's not an irresponsible council. Anybody, and this is just a receipt or report, so anybody can vent on this on the council, and I'll put it to my favorite venter, Ed Botwerf. Thank you. Um, I think the council knows my feelings on this issue. I've been very vocal since the beginning of this process, and I appreciate the community speaking out, and, and the, the thing I have to realize is ultimately, you know, th this is not a PERS versus the library conversation. But what I'm keenly aware of as I sit here is, is that the buck does stop here. This is the body that approves every dime that's spent in this city. Whether it's a raise for our employees, whether it's a building, it's here. Whether we make decisions about how we're going to try to increase revenue, we also make decisions about our expenditures. And after being hopeful and being optimistic and looking at all the drawings and the plans and the architecture and this fabulous library, because the fact of the matter is, we don't build anything in Capitola. The last structure built here was a, a bandstand 
I want to thank Mike Termini for, and all the people that personally went out of their way and made superhuman efforts because there probably wasn't a lot of money and just made it happen. So building something here is something that doesn't take place. So embarking on this library excited everybody. It was a great concept. It's definitely something we need. It was portable. So it was portable trailers that were put over there. And it was, it was not what, what anybody would want, but it worked. And it worked at 4,000 square feet. And we sat here and we passed Measure S and we were optimistic and we raised the money. And the bottom line was we were told that we had a certain amount of dollars and we had saved $3 million from, from um, RDA. RDA and we had a number. And we purposely set out and we approved to build a library that exceeded our number. Which was, which I'm sorry if the buck stops here, it was just bad practice. And then unfortunately, we're not building in a recession, we're building, as one of the speakers mentioned, in a boom. We're, we're, houses are exploding, contractors are bidding jobs 20, 30% over the top. And so we worked, we scrambled, I complained, but we still managed to dig up $2.1 million to, to what we thought was fund the library. And then the shock came in and now it's $2.4 million over because contractors are charging that. So we're sitting here, actually having a conversation about trying to do something that's four and a half million dollars over budget. And the money that we took to dig up did come out of the general funds. And I personally know that there's no bathroom at Monterey Bay Par Monterey Park. And there's a lot of, there's no wall on the br brand new, beautiful architecture we have in front of Bellaroma. There's lots of things that are not being done in the city because everything went into that library. And I appreciate that, that Measure S might come up as a city manager. The city manager is definitely working overtime trying to find money. I recognize that, and with the finance director. But the thing is, we're squeezing all of our other funds for one thing, it's tunnel vision. And I if Measure S does come back with some additional funds, I say it goes back to replenishing the 2.1 that we squeezed out of every other feature that we are not gonna be doing to enhance our city. The bottom line is, we're building too big of a library. And I think that even at the last meeting, the people that were behind that made a comment, and it's even in the minutes of last meeting that we need to maybe redesign this library. And I remember asking the architect in the beginning, can you build me a library a thousand square foot smaller? And I'm not sure of the exact numbers because I've lost track. I do know the original library is 4,000 square feet and the one that we, were gonna, that we could afford is probably 10,000 and we're up at 11,000 and I just can't seem to manage to fathom why going from 4,000 to 10,000 wasn't a great thing, and why it had to be 11,000. As I sit here in this small town with an annual budget of $14 million, $15, $16 million, and this huge expenditure that we're moving forward, and I, and I as one uh, famous parking commissioner always mentions, we always tend to kick the can down the road, and I don't wanna kick the can down the road, and this is the second meeting Steve, I love you as our public works director, but you know you want to come back and do something. I want you to come back and say, we're gonna redraw this library, we're gonna build what we can afford, and if we get the money, because it's gonna cost more, and if we strip this thing down and we take all the features that you wanted to put in there to make it a great library, we're gonna end up with another trailer shack over there. We're all gonna be disappointed. So I say, why not make the goal to build it smaller, build it quality, build it something we're proud of, but quit trying to build the plan that we have right now because it doesn't work. And so my, my, my recommendation in this discussion, because it's just a discussion, is that I hope when you come back to us, that part of what you're coming back with is maybe some conversation that we can have about making it smaller, making it something we can afford, but making it quality, which is what people expect. And I would also be willing, if this council would be willing, to also lower the amount of the name the money that someone could donate to put their name in that library because if somebody were to donate a million dollars instead of the two million ridiculous price tag we put on it, I'd take it. <laughs> Does that mean you'd donate it or you'd? I wouldn't donate it, but oh, I might go encourage somebody I'm, to donate. I'm just trying to. I don't think they'd want my name on it, but I could think of a couple people. Oh, for a million dollars, I'd put your name on it right now. Thank uh, you. Jacques, go ahead. Okay, so um, I appreciate your comments, Ed, and I appreciate the fact that, you know, you did tell us that we should have stuck with a smaller footprint early on. And um, 
I'd also like uh, Mike to tell us a little bit about the costing that went into this because one reason why I voted, and I'll say this to the community, that um, I knew the costing was going to be very careful. And I think Mike's closer to those issues than I am, so I'd like you to go over that for the benefit of the public. Because of that process, it seemed to me that we were going to be pretty close to getting what we thought would be a price consistent with what the architect said it should cost. There's something about Capitola's library. Remember when I first came here, there was a little storefront across the street, I think, and I took my daughter there, and she had a great time. And then we did the mobile home, or the mobiles, or, the, you know, up there by um, Rispin. And for some reason, when Capitola does a library, everyone says, this is like one of the best places that we could go to for a library. I don't know why, but they do. And it's, 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 a, it's not a major building. It's, it's, a, it's basically a mobile home that's been repurposed. There's something about doing something here that really gets people motivated. So I think that's why this city council said, we really do want a library that the community is going to really feel proud of. And it's true, like Ed said, we haven't built much in the recent past, we've tried. So the library in a way will represent capital coming into its own, moving forward and doing things that matter to the community. The library is just a small thing relative to uh, many of the other things we need to do, like the mall, working with the new owners of the mall and making that happen. But one thing I've realized is this, I, would, I can't speak for the whole city council here, but I don't think that we're gonna pay for a library that we can't afford. I certainly won't vote for that. So right now I'm waiting for new cost estimates and maybe redrawing the plans so that we do get something we can afford. And the thing that keeps me happy about this whole process is I know when the library is built, even if it's a little bit smaller, it'll still be a wonderful place for Capitola. So right now we're on a journey to get there. We're trying to do something that's good for the community. We're trying to do something that I know the community will love when it ultimately gets built. Thank you. Stephanie, anything? No, I agree with with Ed's comments. <clears throat> okay, we'll move on, and Steve, come back, and let's let's all note. You have anything? Sorry. You know. I was going to say just that. <laughs> no, really. <laughs> no, really. That's the way I'm feeling right now. This this is my thinking on this. When we when we budgeted for this, we knew, as you said, Ed, that we were going to have to come up with a way to fill that gap. And it looked like in just recent past meeting that we were, what, within $200,000 of, of filling that gap, something along those lines. And it was really exciting. And then the bids came out and we were way, you know, the, the bids themselves were a lot higher than what we expected we were going to need to come up with. So then we had all these options. What do we do? Do we move forward? Do we try to get money come out of it? Do we um, totally redesign? And that's some of what I keep hearing from people is why, do, why don't we just redesign and make it cheaper? And here's my thought. So if we tried to redesign a building at $8,000, then in the six months that it takes to redesign, to go back and, and plan all this stuff, it's not like the construction costs are gonna stop skyrocketing in those six months that we're replanning our library. So we could go back and, and design an $8,000, or excuse me, $8 million library and then say, great, we're within budget now, and then by the time we put it out to bid, we're getting bids for $11 million. So we could still be back in the exact same place that we're in right now, and that was one of my biggest concerns about spending another six months redesigning, only to find ourselves that we're still outside of budget and now have a much smaller library than we ever wanted. I think that we can, I think that we can move forward. I'm hopeful that we can move forward um, in getting back into budget. And with regard to budget, it was, it was carefully um, estimated by four different estimating agencies. I know I've been in construction for 45 years. 
you can't trust any of them. <laughs> but we looked at it. We put a 2% per month escalator on it. That's 24% increase over the year that we started to design this. Believe me, this was picked over carefully, estimated and re-estimated, and brought through a lot of different consultants. Um, so we did the due diligence. And for me, I'm not prepared to spend a, another dollar out of the general fund. We've done our part. We've stepped forward. If it can be um, value engineered to have the same quality building with some fewer amenities, and believe me, this was architect to death. Uh, uh, and anybody in construction can knows that story. And we're just trying to bring it down to reality now. It's not going to be um, a mobile home without the wheels. It's still a quality building. A million and a half off the top on the first pass of VE is promising. And I won't vote for the contract unless we're not committing any money out of the general fund. If there's more Measure S funds, and believe me, there are three other libraries doing the same thing and looking forward to those Measure S funds in filling the gap between what you can design and what you can actually build. Everyone's in the same position. And anyone who thinks that waiting a year for construction to slow down so prices go down, ain't going to happen. And it may level out, but there's no bargains to be had a year from now, guaranteed. So we'll receive the report. Thank you very much. Mr. City Manager. Just a couple points to the council, I think, that may be helpful for you. One is, is that <clears throat> the bids are good for 90 days, so it's going to be Fisher Cut Bait on July 26th. So realistically, what we're trying to do at a staff level is do all the staff work necessary for you to make the best possible decision, which is identify all the VE opportunities, and if there's any additional revenue we can bring in re reasonably. And that'll be on July 26th. It'll be the opportunity that we have to either say yes or no. And if we say no, then we're off on a path of looking at how are we going to scale the building back, redesign, and go back out to bid. So this isn't, I know it may have felt like deja vu here. Two weeks later, we're doing the same thing we did last time. Council had asked us to come back and give another update, but July 26th is a firm date for us to um, make that decision. Good. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. And thank you for the public for your comments. We'll move on to um, introducing an ordinance pertaining to the cannabis retail licensing. Katie? Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. This evening I have before you a retail cannabis establishment ordinance and license ordinance. So this evening we're going to discuss um, a new ordinance that would allow retail cannabis licenses in the city of Capitola as well as an amendment to the zoning code to allow um, retail cannabis establishments in the regional commercial zone. We're also going to look at a, um, a resolution for authorizing criminal history of licensing for licensing purposes and then at the july 26th meeting you'll be reviewing the tax considerations that will go to ballot um, so the proposal the planning commission looked at the proposal during their last meeting for the zoning code update so i'm going to first uh bring bring you the change go over the changes for the regional commercial zone so within the regional commercial zone we're um There'd be an update to the land use table to add retail cannabis establishments into the land use table as a conditional use permit. And tied to that conditional use permit are several um, requirements. One being that um, anyone pursuing a conditional use permit would first have to have a cannabis retail, ha have to have been selected for a cannabis retail license. Um, the second is that the distance um, from schools and churches, there'd be a 1,000 foot um, travel buffer, also a 500-foot buffer between retailers, and you'd be, they'd be required to have independent access, so establishments like the mall could not sell retail cannabis, have, have establishments, and then also specific sign standards. So what does this look like? This On, on this image, I've got um, example locations in the darker blue with a 500-foot buffer. So between uh, Capitola Road and Clare Street, there could be approximately three retail establishments. Can I ask a question? John, I got a postcard. So do I, do I have to recuse myself? 
Um, are you within? I forgot to look at the map. Um, but if I got if a you're within I... 500 feet of any of locations. Of the Claire's location, perhaps. Yeah. I got a postcard, so. Yeah, you should recuse okay. yourself. Okay. I'm going to recuse myself because I live close close to that. Oh, uh, convenient. <laughs> I'm sorry, did I say that? You did. Did you say how convenient? Don't go. No, it is convenient. She's adjacent to the yeah. CR zone. Okay. I'm going to move. Um, yeah, so I could just get out of here. Good to know. During the Planning Commission hearing, Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, the Planning Commission asked also that that we bring forth the idea to the City Council of establishing a 100-foot residential buffer. So the area in yellow is the residential um, zones within Capitola. And then the blue buffer, and I apologize, it's, I should have used a different color, it's kind of hard to see on the slide, um, is the 100-foot buffer that um, they asked that the City Council consider. If a 100-foot residential buffer were adopted or put into the ordinance, um, the Browns Ranch would no longer be able to have retail sales. Also, the area um, north along 41st between um, just north towards the highway, um, north of Clare Street, would also not be allowed to have retail sales. And then the establishments that are set a little bit further back along the east side of 41st, where the Whole Foods Market is, that's too close to residential as well. And to add to this, um, with the no shared entry requirements, that would also take away the mall. So it, it would be very limiting in where these retail establishments could occur if you were to, con um, to adopt a 100-foot buffer from residential. Um, also during Planning Commission, we looked at signs. And at the Planning Commission meeting, we proposed three different options, one being following under the current sign regulations and then uh, intermediate sign regulations than a more conservative. The Planning Commission recommended the more conservative ordinance that signs be limited to the business name and one green cross, uh, 15 square feet maximum. They can only be illuminated while the establishment is open and operating. Um, they would require Planning Commission approval and that there can be no reference to cannabis through symbols or language other than the green cross. So with that, that concludes the the zoning portion of the uh, cannabis retail establishments. And now I'll move on to the cannabis retail licensing. And this I've worked very closely with the chief of police on and the city manager in the drafting of this ordinance. So the cannabis retail licensing will establish a maximum number of licenses. This evening we'll be looking for direction on what the council would like that maximum number of licenses to be before we discuss between one and three. Um, the cannabis license will be based on a competitive merit-based selection. So some of the criteria included in the ordinance are areas of not to be in an area of high crime, that there be a background check required, um, experience with legal cannabis sales and performance record, residency in local enterprise within the region, and then of course looking at the site planning, operations plan, and security plan, which would um, be thoroughly reviewed. This, for the selection process, there would be a panel of a minimum of three non-conflicted indiv individuals selected by the city manager. The applicant would be determined based on who meets the merits. Um, the issuance of a license, once a license is issu issued, the um, applicant who was issued the license would be required to get a conditional use permit from the Planning Commission within six months of issuance, and the st they'd also be required to get a state license within six months. If they were unable to get a conditional use permit or the state license within six months, it would become void, and then another permit, another license would open up for the public process. Um, as we worked through this at first, um, in, in learning the best practices for licenses, um, we worked with a, a separate entity called HDL, who is um, done more than 50% of the ordinances to date in California. And um, they suggested that the license be transferable to a new owner and it would have oversight by the chief of police. They would go through the same background check and make sure that they've got very strong plans for um, safety and protection built into their operating plans. Um, 
and also looking at transferring to new locations. Also, it would have to have a referral from the chief of police, require a conditional use permit from the planning commission, and approval by the state licensing. Um, and within the license, uh, as you see, our ordinance is actually very sh brief compared to most ordinances that are out there. And the operation and safety requirements will be established by the chief of police. The ordinance further um, states that the city manager and chief of police are authorized to establish additional rules, regulations, and standards governed for a cannabis license. That they must be published on the website and they become effective upon publication. So the real uh, ongoing uh, with the license staying in compliance and when they're um, when somebody is awarded a, a license, they'll have to follow all these rules and regulations that are published on the website that are administered by the chief of police, rather than putting them all in the ordinance at this time, because best practices continue to evolve. Um, and then, of course, there's regulations for suspension and revocation. And this evening, or actually leading up to this meeting, we did have a meeting, the, the chief and I, with a local group, the uh, Cannabis Initiative, and they worked, they, they actually brought to us first the amendments that they wanted to see for the sign regulations, and their focus has really been to make sure that there's um, limited advertising towards our youth. And another request that was brought was for, um, for printing, publishing, and advertising to make sure that other than by way of a dedicated business internet website in which people log in and they verify your age, um, limiting the advertisement for cannabis products and sale. So I, I believe you'll hear from them this evening, but that was one request from the public to add to this ordinance that in speaking with our attorney, um, we could modify for the second draft should I be directed this evening. Um, so this evening, for we're asking the city council for direction on residential setbacks, whether or not you'd like us to add a, a setback. And in my slides, I had the 100 feet shown, and also the maximum number of, of license that you would like to establish. And with that, I have the recommendation of approval of the first reading of the ordinance, as well as an adoption for a resolution to allow background checks for the licenses. So I have a question you. for you. Um, with regarding our sign ordinance, mm -hmm. what um, rules about the sign ordinance do liquor stores adhere to? They do not have specific. So it's our, our standard sign ordinance? Standard sign ordinance, yes. Okay. Questions? Staff? Open it up to the public. Anyone like to come up and speak to us? Welcome. Hello. Good evening, council members. My name is Tara Leonard, and I'm the project coordinator for the Santa Cruz County Tobacco Control Program, and I sit on the Cannabis Coalition, which is staffed by Community Prevention Partners, mm -hmm. which you will hear from in a minute. I'm here tonight because I want to share with you some of what we've learned about tobacco retail licensing and tobacco advertising to inform the decisions you have to make about cannabis. Um, there's no question that exposure to tobacco marketing increases tobacco experimentation and use by youth. This has been proven by multiple studies. Um, therefore, advertising restrictions, including store signage, are key strategies for youth prevention. Research has shown that youth are three times more likely to be influenced by tobacco ads than adults, and this advertising is more powerful than peer pressure or even family smoking rates in determining youth use of tobacco. And now, a study was just released in the journal Drug and Alcohol Dependence that finds that adolescents who viewed advertising for medical marijuana were more likely to use marijuana, to express intentions to use marijuana, and to have a positive expectation about marijuana. Indeed, the study's lead author concluded, quote, as more states legalize marijuana for medical or recreational use, we must think carefully about the best ways to regulate marijuana advertising so we can decrease the chances of harm occurring, particularly to adolescents. In Santa Cruz County, we have used tobacco retail licensing, currently in four of our five jurisdictions, to address where and how tobacco products are sold and advertised. And that includes the number, the type, the location, and the density of tobacco retailers. We also have state laws directing the placement of tobacco products 
and the number and placement of both interior and exterior tobacco advertising. Nonetheless, <laughs> it takes constant vigilance to police an industry that looks to youth as its future market. In response to decreasing smoking rates for traditional cigarettes, we have seen a huge surge in flavored tobacco products, such as e-cigarettes or jewels or vapes that target youth with candy, fruit flavors, colorful, child-friendly packaging. And in fact, recent studies have shown that 80% of young people who have ever used tobacco started with a flavored product, most likely a product that didn't even exist 10 years ago. So now, policymakers are having to play catch up and working to reduce youth exposure to these products through additional restrictions. You probably know that just a few weeks ago, San Francisco voters supported a complete ban on the sale of flavored products in their city. And we are currently in discussion about flavored tobacco restrictions with several jurisdictions in Santa Cruz County. So I just hope you will take this information into account as you deliberate about the important issues before you tonight and think strategically in advance as much as possible about how you will protect youth from premature cannabis initiation. Thank you. Thank you. Come on up. Uh, good evening. My name is Jenna Shankman, and I'm a community organizer at United Way of Santa Cruz County and um, a member of Community Prevention Partners. So to, to introduce um, Community Prevention Partners, Santa Cruz County Community Prevention Partners, which is more well known by the acronym CPP, is a coalition of committed youth, parents, businesses, media, youth serving organizations, law enforcement, faith-based organizations, civic and volunteer groups, healthcare agencies, substance misuse prevention, um, organizations, seniors, students, and community members who are dedicated to positively impacting thriving and well-being in Santa Cruz County. We provide information on best practices for substance misuse prevention and implement evidence-based environmental strategies that specifically limit access and promotion of substances to young people. One of the most effective strategies to prevent uh, youth use is to prevent youth exposure to advertising and to stop cannabis advertising that's aimed directly at youth. Uh, research, as um, Tara said, shows that tobacco, alcohol, and cannabis advertising increase youth use and decrease their perception of harm. In fact, in a recent RAND study, which followed over 6,000 youth over seven years, they found that adolescents who reported greater exposure to cannabis advertising were more likely to have used cannabis in the previous 30 days and were more likely to report that they expected to use cannabis in the next six months, and they had um, positive views about cannabis. Uh, youth who were exposed to more advertising were also more likely to report negative consequences, um, including missing school, having trouble concentrating on tasks, and doing something they felt sorry for later, um, or getting in trouble. Um, although there are some state-level restrictions on alcohol, tobacco, and cannabis advertising, industry um, finds loopholes, and we are all too familiar with the proliferation of advertising that ensues. In fact, another interesting finding um, in the RAND study is the proportion of youth who reported seeing cannabis advertising had increased sharply in those seven years from 2010 to last year in 2017 from 25 to 70 percent. So local advertising restrictions are a best practice in public health to foster a healthier environment for our youth. And um, we talked previously about signs, since that can contribute um, kind of a visible culture of advertising and appreciate the recommendations that the Planning Commission put forward. Um, but we generally would just like to thank the council and city staff for all your research on this issue, thinking about security, thinking about what products have specific youth appeal um, that we know kind of come out, um, as mentioned again, with tobacco without um, kind of that foresight and really kind of thinking about how to put that public health, safety, and youth use prevention into this ordinance. Thank you. Okay, step up. I know you're all friends. You can get closer. Okay. I know Jenna. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, my name is Les Forster, and Mary and I live over in Oak Drive here in Capitola. We had the pleasure several months ago of taking part in the Capitola Gover Government Academy, uh, which was very beneficial. And one of the highlights of that session was a presentation by Scott Turnbull, who, as you all know, is the superintendent here in the Soquel um, Union Elementary School District. 
clearly, as has been said by a number of folks in the room tonight, Capitola has a focus on supporting and maintaining healthy youth in this community. Parks and Recreation, um, Junior Lifeguards, a variety of other programs that sustain youth and promote them, uh, regardless of anybody in the room's feelings about cannabis, and there are many, I'm just urging you to put your educator hats on. We're all educators here for this conversation. I'm a retired principal. I worked in education for a number of years, mostly at the high school level. So I would just urge you as you continue to consider where this conversation is going is to look at this conversation, especially around advertising. Who is the target market? Uh, who needs to get what messages, when, how, and to what extent, and where. And please keep in mind that the impact of certain messages on youth carries more weight than you might sometimes realize. So thanks again for your focus on kids, especially adolescents in our community. Thank you. Next. Good evening, I'm Mary Gockel Forster, um, community resident for over nine years, um, educator for over 30 years, and the majority of that time with middle school and high school students. Um, you've heard information from all the previous speakers about how impactful advertising can be. I wanna encourage you to think about that right now, and instead of um, correcting or um, having to come back and tightening any re regulations or realizing the impact of the advertising on the youth, to think about it ahead of time, to put the um, safety of our youth and the development of our youth to make that primary. Um, I am so impressed with a group called Friday Night Live. These young people train um, about the laws, about the amount of advertising that can be placed in the windows of um, businesses selling alcohol, and they will go and they will um, see that if that percentage is, um, ex uh, is exceeded, and they will go in and talk. They, as the teenagers, will go in and talk to the business people and help them be aware of that, um, the ordinances, and where they may be um, exceeding that. So our young people want to be safe, they wanna be healthy, they wanna be part of our community, they wanna be part of the decisions. So I would encourage you to keep them in mind and keep them at the center and do that before um, you uh, complete the ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back, Khalil. Thank you, Mr. Germini. Thank you, Council. I just want to express my gratitude again for you guys even being willing to uh, put this on the agenda today. And I want to thank the community and also CPP and, and, and Les. I, I couldn't agree more with all the previous speakers today. Um, so once again, my name is Khalil Mutawakil. I'm CEO and co-founder for Kind Peoples. We've been around for nearly five years in the county of Santa Cruz. We have two locations to serve. Uh, we started out in 2013 with nine employees. We currently have nearly 100, and we're looking to continue to expand. Uh, I spent uh, many years uh, prior to 2013 and, and when we opened our business crafting ordinances with both the County of Santa Cruz and the City of Santa Cruz, and we've come to a pretty good uh, ecosystem, I would say, and I also want to uh, congratulate staff on putting together the ordinance that we have before us today. Uh, I really don't have a lot of um, uh, complaints or feedback there. Um, a couple things I do want to mention in my time, uh, the advertising portion. Uh, the state has just mandated that uh, cannabis advertisement must be limited in the same way that alcohol is limited. So we can only advertise if um, the, the uh, medium in which we're advertising can be shown uh, to have a 71.6% uh, 21 years of age and older uh, uh, rate of, uh, not finding my word there, but uh, you get the picture. Uh, number two, I also want to point out in Colorado, uh, youth uh, access and youth use uh, plummeted and it continues to plummet in Colorado post legalization every single year it's fallen currently it's at the lowest that it's ever been so the advertising restrictions do work uh, we are satisfied with an age gate portal to uh, be able to conduct advertising for pricing uh, image images of, of, of product so on and so forth uh, and I just want to paint you a little picture if you walk into the kind people's dispensary it's a very welcoming atmosphere. It's a very normalized retail experience. Um, they're not all that way, but um, there are a lot of professional actors out there, and I think my main message to the council tonight is, is really to choose your partners uh, wisely, because they are partners. They'll be here for a long time. Um, the last thing I want to mention is the 100-foot setback for, for, for residences. So um, 
in the city of Santa Cruz, they do not have a setback for residences at all. Um, however, they do provide opportunities for exceptions. So for the setbacks that they do have for other businesses, for parks and schools and those types of things, they offer the ability uh, to have an exception because there's not always a one size fits all approach um, that works. So that's all I've got. Um, I don't know if it's appropriate. I'd uh, surely love to have any conversations with you. Uh, be able to answer any questions if I can leave a card. May I do that? Mm -hmm. Sure. Thank you. City Clerk will take it. Next. Hey, Vic. Vic Morani. I uh, wore this special Hawaiian shirt in your honor tonight. We wouldn't have let you in if you didn't have it on I, I, I bought it at the, the Capitola Mall when good. the Aptos Shoes and Apparel were going out of business, so I got a really good deal. If anyone, they still got some left, by the way, if you guys want to do that. Um, I'm Vic Morani, uh, former coach, high school teacher. Obviously know those folks really well. Um, I also have the privilege of serving as uh, your elected uh, member on the county school board for several years and eventually as the board president about 10 years ago. Um, on something like this, I always think it's important because it is such a tight-knit community that you check in with your other elected officials. And you've got a great school board here just up the street. And I don't know if this has really been sunshine with these folks. Um, you also have a member of the county school board who's been appointed in, and she's a Capitola resident. Mm -hmm. And you used to have, one back in the day, I, there was another guy, Bud Winslow, who was a great guy. I remember him quite well. And George and I get together and talk about stuff. But um, I just think it's a really good idea to check in with people, especially in, they might view this as like, hey, you're kind of slipping this in at summertime where the kids are out or whatever. You know, It's good to have dialogue with people. I'm not saying you shouldn't do it. I'm just saying it would be really smart to use this whole next month between now and July 26 to do that. Um, I was privileged a few years back, a group called Power Valley Community Alliance came to me. They knew I was kind of a bridge guy who did a lot of dialogue with people in the business community as well as education. And uh, Wattsville was, wanted to be on the front end of a lot of this cannabis stuff. And I have to admit, I had a certain attitude going into it, and now I have a completely different attitude about it. And I think a lot of the state has sort of reflected that thinking. Um, I'm going to share a couple things with you that Watsonville learned, and if it helps you, it helps you, and maybe it works for you. Number one, you said one to three possible, you know, applicants. Watsonville threw out the idea of one because if you do one, it looks like you're giving a monopoly to somebody, and then you got lawsuits and, you know, all kinds of stuff, like Mr. Barrisoni comes out of retirement and decides this isn't so smart financially. So I'd say two or three if you're looking at something like that. Second thing, um, you talked about these six-month intervals and perform or not. Well, the state kind of makes things up whenever they want and changes things. So I think if you have some sort of artificial six-month deal with them, you might find out that's not a good idea. So you might want to leave that a little open-ended. And then the last one is these residential setbacks. It's great. The 1,000-foot thing is a state requirement with schools. Got it. Child care facilities, all that kind of good stuff. But that 100-foot one is a real nasty one because there could be a 10-foot wall with barbed wire and just on the other side is a housing development. And it's like no one's going to climb over that to, to get to, the, you know what I mean? I mean, it's kind of like some of these places were bunkers in Wattsville. There's no way they were going to get in. But just on the other side of the wall, there was some old house that had been there forever. So looking at those maps and those circles and poor Stephanie having to leave, you know, I'd say 86 that 100-foot deal. But other than that, good dialogue with people. I'm glad you're having the conversation. And, you know, I stand by if you ever need any assistance with just some ideas. Thank Thanks, you Vic. Very much. We appreciate it. No problem. Anyone else? Seeing no one, we'll bring it back to the council. Um, a lot of decision points here. Can I make a point of clarification? Please do. Okay. Um, so just to be clear, I, I had underlined a portion of this just to um, highlight the fact that within the request, the whole, the whole paragraph is the requested language mm -hmm. that would be added for, to, um, under the grounds for license revocation. And I had underlined the one section to just specify that the, at the very end of the sentence, it says pricing of cannabis, details regarding specific cannabis products, cannabis photography and graphics, 
related to the cannabis plant or cannabis products, they would only be accessible to the public um, by way of a dedicated business internet website that you'd have to be age verified. So they are asking for the whole paragraph. I under I didn't want you to think the underline was a red line to a right. something that's in there. So. And and this was a request by the organization exactly. that spoke to us. This did not come from. I see nothing wrong with it. Yeah, it, it came from the just to just yeah. to clarify. We all read the letter. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And this is their suggestion with regard to advertising. Exactly. Yeah. Perfect. Um, and so I will clarify that the first reading would be an amended. That the first reading would incorporate right. this the language as yeah, an amendment. The council could give us direction, and when it comes back for final adoption, it would have this language, and the council could finally adopt it at its next meeting. Let me run down my points real quick. Um, can I, can I, I just express, can you put up the map that shows 100% Okay, what you're yeah, about. do that. Just, like, um, go ahead. The advertising, I agree with the language, nice and easy. I hear a, a responsible retailer who, you know, also supports it. That's enough for me, and, and it, it, there's a rationale behind it. I like it. Um, and I think that it's been years since we ever saw anybody, you know, smoking a cigarette or consuming alcohol on television. So there's there's precedent for this. This is the this is the path we take to ensure that we don't subliminally, you know, incite our youth. Um, I think that the hundred foot setback should not happen. It's too articulated. It there's the sound wall example that Vic brought up is all the way behind the Clare Street um, strip mall. So I'm in favor of no one hundred foot setback. Obviously, the thousand foot setback state law and makes sense and we're we restrict ourselves enough just by the the small zone that we allow it in and if you take the mall out of that zone it gets even smaller um, i believe that the the sign ordinance i think that restricting what can go on the sign makes sense from an advertising standpoint i cannot uh, in good conscience restrict the size of a business's sign because of the business they are. So if a liquor store has 15 square feet, a cannabis retailer should have 15 square feet. I do understand that sign symbols are a form of advertising. That's perfectly within, you know, and I think that's a rational way to go. I wouldn't want to see a, an animated liquor store sign showing somebody drinking, you know, bourbon from a bottle. <laughs> um, you know, it's, um, it's a throwback kind of a thing. Don't need to see that. It's a liquor store. Okay, good enough. That's what it is. Same thing here. Same square footage as any other retail establishment. It's a cannabis retailer, plain and simple. Um, those are my only points. And I'll pass on to Kristen. Uh, and, and I'm not locked into the green cross thing because, you know, it could be a green leaf for all I care or no symbology. My, my mind was changed on the green cross. It was. It really? was. Oh. It was. I was, I was adamantly <laughs> against the green cross. <laughs> and, uh, you know, my mind was my mind was changed because I felt that there was valid reason for having it there um, being known as it is now as what it is. Um, I felt that it's better than having like a leaf, you know, or a plant. Um, um, other than that, I will say I agree with the 100 foot, with, with what you said about the 100 foot setback for residential zones. I don't think we should have that. Um, there was a couple comments about us not um, making too many decisions now or keeping in mind that we should make decisions now. And when I was at the League of Cities conference today, they had a whole hour and a half forum called Cannabis and Your City. And the panelists were the legisla a legislative rep, the Bureau of Cannabis Control, Cannabis Policy Enforcement for the City of Sacramento, and the uh, legislative analyst for the California Police Chief Association. So it was people that are really looking into this issue um, closely and working on it. And one of the things they did say is that they are anticipating more regulatory changes in the next couple years. That's from the Bureau of Cannabis Control. And so I, I think that it's important that we start what we're doing now and just keeping in mind that as regulations change on the state level, we're going to have to continue to, to adjust our regulations potentially uh, on the local level. Um, and, and one of the other things that I highlighted here was um, the city of Sacramento's cannabis policy and enforcement 
uh, guy was saying that he's been working in policy for 20 years and that cannabis is the single most complicated public policy matter he's ever worked on. So um, I think that that's uh, an interesting comment from someone who's been 20 years in public policy and I've been here for a year and a half and I'm still kind of trying to wrap my head around public <laughs> policy and this is you know a very complicated one indeed. Um, I'd say I agree not just one shop. I'm okay with two or three. Um, what else was it? Was that it? The shops, the number of shops, the signage, the Shop buffer. Back. Signage? Signage, yeah, I was saying I'm okay with the cross. And the size of the sign, should we restrict Oh, the size further? of the sign. You know, I, um, I, I hadn't really given any thought to that, but I agree with you. If it's going to be a, a sign, it might as well be within the same size as the rest of the sign ordinance. I agree with that. So in the regional commercial um, establishments can have a sign that's one square foot per linear foot of frontage mm -hmm. up to 50 square feet. Right. So the Just signs so would be yeah. no bigger or smaller than we have for the dock in the box or the Japanese restaurant or what have you. That's correct. Yeah. There, there's a couple exa of examples of larger signs out there that have got special approvals. But under the new side and ordi ordinance, there's a maximum of 50 square feet. Good. They'd have to have the ample frontage to qualify for that, though. They would. They'd have to have 50 <laughs> feet of 50 feet. frontage. Yeah. Okay. And, and the other part of the sign ordinance is that there, cannabis signs are required to go to planning commission. So if the direction is to treat them as all, as all other signs are treated, then they, if they comply, they should not have to go to planning commission, or I'll take direction on that. But, but there are we have restrictions regarding the content of the sign. Would that be vetted by the police department? It seems like the planning commission is a logical place, or is it would it be done by your department over the counter? So uh, I, what I'm hearing is possibly a change to the size of the sign. No, not the size of the sign. We're talking about the content oh, the, just that the we're point. letting it be, you know, uh, name of the business only. Green cross is the only kind of symbology, and that's pretty much it. So if someone came to you and the sign were covered in green cannabis leaves that would be a violation of this but it wouldn't necessarily have to go to the planning commission but where i want to know where the choke point is where do we control that the design of the sign um so so it depends on how we draft the ordinance right now the design of the sign would be limited to the business name and a green cross right only and 15 square feet so the only change i'm hearing so far is in the square footage of the sign according to our regular sign ordinance. So the question I have is, who reviews the design of the sign? So Mr. Mayor, I think I can answer that easily. I think the, the, the it's not, right now it requires a use permit. So the planning commission is gonna be looking at the use permit. And so normally we would take a sign permit along with the use permit. And so sure. it would, it, they would be part and parcel. So I think it's probably at this stage, not terribly important. If you wanna have it ministerial, like the other CR zone signs, or you want to leave it with the planning commission? No, if you're saying the planning commission gets to review it, I see no reason why they shouldn't have to review the sign as well. And that's the way it's drafted. Yeah. The, the only, I mean, I honestly, the only thing I can imagine is, is 10 years from now, if the business were to change and it would go through the approval process with the chief of police and they want to change the sign, that means they have to go back to the planning commission, which frankly, you know, I think we can cross that bridge when we get to it. Yes. Okay, very clear. Thank you. Jacques, anything? Yeah. Any history behind the 100 feet limit? No, you know, the, I guess the history of it was um, a few residents making comment to the planning commissioners mm -hmm. and them just asking that there was no direction or recommendation for a 100 foot buffer. They just wanted to, um, wanted the city council to be aware of um, the, the neighbor's concern and they thought it would be a good discussion for the city council to have. Okay. But they did not recommend including that in the ordinance. Comments? I thought it mostly referred to manufacturing and stuff like that and uh, smell, you know, odors and stuff. So you didn't want to be too close. So you had that issue somewhat mitigated by distance. That's and and we don't allow that here anyway. So yeah, we don't allow that here anyway. Right. So I'm not necessarily in favor of 100. Okay. Um, Ed. Can you go back to the drawing of the, uh, the 100 feet? Well, if I'm, I'm reading this right, um, if I'm looking at uh, Brown's Ranch, is it pretty much that because the blue line goes through those businesses that none of those are eligible for uh, an occupancy? That's correct. And if I look on 41st Avenue on the 
It's going to be on the right-hand side of the, of the picture. Those, all those in the front are eligible or are not? Are they precluded because of property lines? or? In the front, um, they could be eligible as long as the, there's a 100-foot buffer between the property line and the building. Yeah, I, I guess when I'm asking about the 100 feet, because some of the lots, like let's say, for example, McDonald's, you know, the, the back of the lot line goes all the way to the fence. So is, is it 100 feet from the property line or is it 100 feet from the location of the business? And, and is it, that it would be, we could draft it. It's not drafted yet, but the way I was thinking about it would, under this scenario, is be from the property line to 100 feet. So if the structure was not, that would, would be enclosing the retail establishment was not within that 100 foot buffer, then it could be on that property, but outside the 100 foot buffer. Okay. But, and that's what I'm trying to interpret here. But under the 100 foot buffer, the BevMo site and those would be too close. Yeah. So if that blue line goes through any building, that building is off the table. Right. So that arrow is intended to signify the places that would be out. So Browns Ranch would be out. Yeah. The BevMo CVS Center out. Here's the logic. I'll go back. I mean, I think I have enough. You can go ahead and leave that up just for now, just for, for conversation, because, you know, I, I'm not a big proponent of this, as I think I've made clear in the past. It's kind of like it's a necessary evil that we're going to deal with, and uh, I still believe that it's going to be impactful on our police department. We're making no allowances for that, but um, I am concerned about the fact that there was a 3-2 vote on the Planning Commission. just tells me there was some not... Planning Commission's been pretty good lately about agreeing on things and try to be supportive when they send something to us. When I get something from them that's 3-2, I'm not sure why it's 3-2. I don't know if it's because of the whole concept, if it's because of a sign, if it's because of 100 feet. I know that we killed a, a drive through at McDonald's because one neighbor complained about it. So, you know, I think there is some sensitivity about when neighbors weigh in on something. I think we put this in a pretty good area. The only reason that we might be concerned about the 100 foot setback is because we're trying to cram too many places into there. So we want to make these so they don't overlap. So. I'm not big on the number. I can understand. I mean, if I got to live with this necessary evil, which, you know, um, I'm hoping that we can get this council to come up with a reasonable number. Uh, one's probably not a good number because I, I understand the monopoly thing. I would love if we could end up on land on two. Uh, I think it's plenty. I think if there was two, then the spacing would probably allow that in that configuration, we'd be able to find two places where people could sell this commodity um they could still maintain the 100 foot buffer which would satisfy the neighbors i think i read in the in the in the uh in the notes watsonville has a six foot sign limit six square feet one's at six one's at 12. One's at 12 one's at, I, saw one at yeah. 15. I like smaller I, I i don't think these need to be big i i don't see the reason for 15. i'm 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 looking for something 10 or less nine's a good number uh, uh, I'm okay with what the criteria are that says, uh, you know, the address and the, and the green sign. I think if you, you know, it's kind of like, you know, we, there's branding that goes on, you know, I'm pretty good now. I, I can find a Starbucks from half a mile away because I'm looking for their little branding logo. And if I was looking for this green, uh, just like an emergency room, you know, with a red cross in front, I always find it. So if it had the green cross in front, I think you would find it. Um, Trying to be sensitive to the advertising, you know, the, the advertising is in a sign, it's in so many different ways. Um, I think Krista made a good point that the people are having trouble writing this, this initiative is the most difficult one to write because people are so divided on it because it's just not sure how it's gonna work in their community. Um, obviously there's revenue here, you know, and, and, I, and I should be putting on my Republican hat and, and seizing all revenue available, you know, but I'm, I'm, I'm just concerned about the impact on our town. Um, can, uh, is it okay, good point now to make a motion for the number of, st of store? I'm gonna go ahead and make a motion that we uh, allow two uh, dispensaries, uh, include the 100 foot setback and limit the sign to nine feet. <laughs> Not here in a second. I, I, well, but maybe there maybe it's just was too, motion, so maybe I, it was just too many things in one place and why don't you just yeah, why don't time? we try okay one at a time one at a time one at a time yeah. okay let's just say that uh, I make a recommendation that we allow two dispensaries is there a second second any further discussion all in favor aye, aye. two 
wow. she did you. Wow. <laughs> Making me feel good now. Oh, don't get too <laughs> comfortable. Know, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, There's a groove now. Yeah. Don't, don't know, get I, too I, comfortable, I buddy. I realized to savor the, maybe savor anything. Savor the okay. moment. Yeah. Savor the moment. Uh, you can let somebody else make a motion, but you can go forward. Carry on. Um, <laughs> I'll make a motion that we retain the 100-foot setback. Is there a second? Clarification, it's not retain. It would be an oh, addition. Establish, I'm sorry. Establish a 100-foot setback from residents. I feel it failing for lack of a second. You want to go to your next item? Make a motion that we limit the size of the sign to 10 feet, 10 square feet. Two feet by five feet. Or three foot by three foot. They Including do. the green or in addition or to the green cross? No, it's... it's Total total square. I'm footage. thinking of it as a, like a planning commissioner. Okay. Total square footage would including be the green cross. Ten square feet and and with the same criteria. I think Katie said it was limited to a uh, name of the business and a green cross. How big is that cross? Do we I know? would estimate that that's about 15 square that's feet. A 15 the square cross footer. and then the treehouse sign is maybe four square feet. Oh, it's more than that. Or it's more? more that. Oh no, it's definitely more. Yeah. That's so maybe Please. 10 by 2. I think it's good that we're getting a sense of what, because we're just dealing with numbers. If we're looking at this, and what are we looking Where's at about? We're looking at about 20 square feet of signage right here? No, no total. Total? There's 15 total. So I, I think like the treehouse sign might be 8 square feet, but this monument sign out front is... You know, I, I'm a little confused now because I'm talking about one sign. Now, if you're talking about a total cumulative, it would total. be like a, a limit. Oh, then I would... Let me, let me redo that. Motion. That's why I was I leaning limit, towards the. I would limit the motion to um, sign total not to exceed um, 15 square feet, with one sign not to be bigger than 10 square feet. So 15 feet total, none larger than 10. Correct. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any further discussion? I think that's uh, okay. 15. Nothing bigger than five or ten. bigger than ten, and I'm looking here at at the at the least twenty square feet. So even this is too big. In, in my mind. In your in mind. In my motion. And we mind. have a second. Yeah. Okay. Um, anybody else have any comments on the the sign portion? Can, I, can we get clarification on what the sizes are on our current sign ordinance? Currently, the sign ordinance allows you to have multiple signs that have a maximum limit um, when added together of 50 square feet or one square foot per linear foot of frontage. So if this building, we'll just say it's 40 feet wide, they would have a maximum total signage for squ uh, square footage for 40 square feet. So could they use that all in one sign? Could they make one huge 40 square foot sign? No, because I think our wall signs are limited to 36 square feet, and then we've got other regulations for monument signs not to be larger than a certain size. So there's added layers of limitations for the type That's of That's kind of where I was going with the our, own, our resisting sign ordinance, because it's been carefully crafted, and if you look around our town, the signs are um, modest. Mm -hmm. our, our new ordinance is uh, more conservative, the new sign code, and it allows administrative permitting of signs. So we, we really uh, decrease the amount of square footage you could have in a location with an administrative permit. You can always ask for extra and go to planning commission. But So it is more modest. Now. Further comments on signs? Yeah, I, you know, to me, this is a different kind of sign than like a doctor's office or a grocery store or something like that. Um, you know, we've heard a lot of testimony here that, you know, we don't want to splash this out. I'm just paraphrasing mm -hmm. to, you know, youth basically. Right. And I actually agree with Ed. I know where every single green sign is within yeah. Yeah. 41st across the highway. Do we know it? Do we know it? Right. Okay. okay. So small is fine. I think people will find it's there. And if you look at the treehouse sign, right, it's normal. No, uh, absolutely agreed. But I'm but if you look at this, this the green the, the green star, uh, cross, right? Abnormal. It's, it's predominant, or it's predominant. It's predominant. I mean, in, in comparison, I see nothing wrong with the treehouse sign, and the treehouse sign is probably no taller than two feet, and it's probably it could it could be eight eight or nine square feet. Okay, it, it's uh, probably 
two by ten. It's probably two by ten. It's about twenty square. What I'm saying is your your motion. The numbers. The, the door. The doors are three feet wide. Okay. There's two doors there. Okay. So it's probably six feet at the most. Thirty-six inch door. There's two doors. Treehouse is probably six feet. Are we counting just the words or the whole thing that's on? You, the whole the whole dimension. What I'm saying is, words. I think we're confusing numbers with appearance, and that appearance right there. I guarantee you that treehouse sign is bigger than six feet, but be that as it may, let's say it's six feet and there's and it's two feet tall and it's 12 square feet. That alone eliminates the ability to put the green cross out. So I'm, I'm comfortable letting our sign ordinance handle this. And that's saying, especially with stores that, you know, these stores, the, if I'm correct, are gonna be well off the roadway and not, you know, this kind of a thing. If this were on the edge of Capitola Road or on 41st, I'm there with you. But we have specific sign ordinances about monuments and about wall signs, even though they're 80 feet from the wall, from the roadway. So along 41st Avenue within our sign code, you can have either a, a monument sign or a wall sign. Unless you're a certain amount back, then you can have, um, then you have can get additional privileges for being limitedly visible, but if you're right up on 41st Avenue, so if it were Bank of America that became this establishment, um, they would be able to have a sign right along the road under this ordinance up to 15 square feet or two signs that don't exceed 15 square feet in total. So that's two feet by six feet, and that sign is bigger, but I will, l I will call for a vote if we're ready, unless you want to go up there and measure that tree outside. Well, just, just remember, you know, we, we haven't got to the 100 foot setback yet. No, okay. no, agreed. Keep, keep in mind that, 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 you know, once the 100 foot setback fails, okay, the, the incentive would be to, to, to have the building back and have the monument signed. If there's an allowance to have more advertising, any business will have more advertising. And what Katie just said was, is that if there's a certain distance back, they'll get the monument signed and the wall signed. Do we have, yeah. Instances, I don't, I can't think of anything except I, for a know, master I, sign pro, uh, you know. I really feel awkward because normally we get a recommendation from the planning commission, right. you know, and, and right. they are more astute at making these recommendations. So for us, this, I'm struggling with, with, you know. This was their recommendation. Um, this was the third most conservative option. They added the green cross to it. Originally, it just allowed the business name. So this is the planning commission's recommendation. We gave them three options at planning commission and what you're seeing here was they went right, for the most I'm conservative approach. I'm seeing the yeah. 15 square foot and I'm thinking, so is that for just the building sign or is that for the building and they get another 15 for the monument sign? It's total. They get 15 so, square foot max. Yep, so between a monument sign and a wall sign, it's 15 square feet. And max. either one of those signs, either the Green Cross or the tree house covers that 15 square feet in, in my the monument sign definitely exceeds the 15 yes, square it feet. Does. Yeah, so just e either of those, so. Let me, let me amend the motion. Yeah. Amend the motion to accept planning commission recommendation as stated on the board here. You already have a second for your motion. I'll, I'll second it. I know that, but, but, but it wasn't clear, but yeah. it was all the language. If this is what the planning commission is recommending and this limits the total available signage they can advertise, this meets what I was trying to accomplish. This is the same thing that you just motioned, but you just added the word planning commission. I did. Well, I, you know, <laughs> I, I, I put an exclusion there for, for one sign not to exceed 10 feet. Total of 15, one not to exceed. I didn't, I would drop that. He parsed it out. They get 15 square feet. They can divvy it up any way they want. I put a restriction okay. on the other one. How about a roll call vote? Council member Bertrand. Aye. Council member Peterson. No. Council Member Botorf? Aye. And Mayor Termini? No. Fails at a tie. Let's try again. Um, oh. I, I can understand everyone's reluctance to go to the up to, was it 40 feet? 50 feet. Yeah. 50. Up to 50 feet. 50, 50 feet's a lot. I got that. Even though I'm reluctant to, uh, you know, equal uh, treatment under the law, we're basically doing the scarlet letter on cannabis locations because of what they sell. Right. 
I, I can I ask a question? Should maybe add that the chief and I went to many of the three establishments. We I asked for feedback on um, from the different um, people that were there of what did the, were um, under the county established regulations. Did they were they frustrated with the sign regulations and how restrictive they are? And the feedback I got was we're not that worried about it. People know where we are. We've got our green cross. Um, and and <laughs> the county, I, I want to say, is 12 square feet. I think it was recently amended, the county. But that was the, uh, the feedback I got from at three establishments that we visited when I asked that question. Granted, it may not, it was workers that were there. It wasn't the owners. But is this in the county? Yeah. This is, question. these regulations are um, larger than the county's regulations. Question. Yeah. If, if you could indulge me, there's two planning commissioners in the room, and if either one of them could come up here and just shed some light on whether the <laughs> planning commission was in agreement with this agreement on the on the square footage was unanimous or was it a split vote. I'm not seeing either planning commissioner rushing to the podium. Oh, I am. Oh, there I we go. Am. Well, I am. I, well, you have to be patient. It's 10 minutes to 10. Nobody's rushing anywhere. That's I right. This is going to be so boring. Hi, Sam. Good evening, everyone. I wasn't planning on uh, coming up, but um, uh, I am the chair of the Planning Commission. Um, and I can tell you, yeah, we had, a, I think, a very robust discussion about the size of the sign. And what you see in the split vote was a reflection of uh, the majority wanting to have a minimal sign, signage, um, because um, even though it is legal, I mean, it was still recognized that it's under federal law. It's still a Schedule I uh, illegal substance. And because we're going through a period of transition, um, we wanted to start with a bit of discretion and some controls in the community and seeing where it was going to go before we opened it up. Some of the other discussion is very similar to what you're having this evening. It's a legal substance. Why should it be treated any differently? That was part of um, our discussion as well. Um, and, um, and I think that there were a couple of, of plenty commissioners who didn't see the need to put any restrictions um, on the, on the s s size of the sign. Um, and, um, and then also we brought up and recommended the, the 100 uh, foot buffer from the residents. Mm -hmm. And so that's, I hope that answers your question uh, about you know w how we arrived and why there was a split vote. Um, I think that we did want to keep it uh, modest to Understood. start. Understood. Thank you. Thank you. TJ. So the chairman's story did a great job of explaining that and I would agree with. The only thing I would uh, mention, I didn't come up before because I, you, you had kind of our recommendations there, but this 100 foot setback, we had some dialogue with people in the Claire's Avenue area who have a, a real strong concern about the amount of traffic that comes through their their neighborhood to get to that uh, the mall area? Um, so the hundred foot setback was something that we you know we kind of went around and came up with the hundred. Some people wanted more. Some people uh, maybe didn't want that. But um, we felt real strongly uh, uh, about having that set setback because of that. And uh, I'll tell you, I was one of the dissenting votes ag against having this I for me we're 1.7 square miles uh, mm -hmm. I think you've got well I think our proponents here said there's we're the highest density in in the state of Santa, Santa Cruz County and how many can you really fit uh, I don't care about monopolies I think one would be great but um, you know you, you are the commission that is going to approve this so that was some of the feedback that we discussion we had on the planning okay. commission. what were the other <laughs> levels of sign sizing that the Planning Commission were offered. I'm going to bring up a slide for you that I. <laughs> okay, so. The, the first one is, this is according to the sign ordinance, is it not? Yep, the first one's according to the sign ordinance, so that first line. Um, one square foot per one linear foot, so 50 square feet. Number of signs, you can have multiple. Logo, you can have a logo and or a green cross. Um, illumination is, would be allowed. Reference to cannabis would be allowed. Under option two, it was a maximum of 20 square feet. 
it was a maximum of one sign, um, logo or a green cross, and then illumination is allowed and reference to cannabis would be allowed. And I'm going to go back and check. I, I thought we allowed multiple signs under our option three, but I'm going to check the ordinance now because I'm seeing in my table it says no, one. That's okay for me. I mean, I I have to tell you, it, it uh, I'm, I'm beginning to drink the Kool-Aid on the I'm not the 50-foot sign ordinance. I, I'm, but like I said, the 15 feet is smaller than you would think. Um, the only thing that bothers me about option two is I think that illumination during business hours is plenty during operating hours. That, that was something that we had from the letter from our, our friends, and that made good sense. Um, I don't know. You want to give it another shot, Ed? Can I ask a question? Yeah, time? please. Sorry, just to clarify. So, so it looks like the slide that we had before was saying that there was allowed to have a green cross, but no other kind of symbols or whatever pertaining to cannabis. But the first two are saying you could have a logo and or a green cross, which sounds like you could have a plant, a leaf or mm -hmm. something like that. And option three says neither. But the one that we were just looking at only had the cross. So which one of those options is that? That was the change they made. They oh, they that. added the green cross. So oh, right. And I, and I should clarify, within the ordinance, it is drafted um, that they shall be limited to one exterior building sign. So if you want the option of letting them have multiple, we should modify that. But so right now it's limited to one sign. Um. Regardless of setback, because you brought up that other, the monuments, I'm concerned about. Regardless of setback. Okay. I see, I'm against monuments at the baseline being the, the sign Nazi and the planning commission for many years, so, yeah. I don't like monuments at all. You don't like them. Oh. Good. I'm, 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 no. I'm, because I, I think that there's probably, I sense that there's agreement on option three with maybe just not the size of the sign. Yeah. That yeah, maybe, go up a little bit. Maybe. You know, uh, uh, the illumination, I'm, I'm fine with you just during the hour's operation. They're prohibited. Um, I don't have a problem with the green cross being included. You know, I, I'm fine with that because that's right. why I'm willing to make the sign smaller because one little thing says a thousand words. You know, it's like no. the green cross says, this is what I'm looking for. Okay. And, and I, that's why I'm reducing it down in size because sure. they can put the cross, keep it small. They're going to know where it's at. It isn't going to be like it's a mystery or <laughs> they're going to find it. Okay. So I, 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 I didn't, we tried fifth, we tried option three and it just, it stalled. Right. So I'm going to try option three, but I'm going to change it to 20 square feet. And, and let's go through it so they can have the cross. They can have the square cross, feet. Everything that's on option three. Illuminated during business hours only. The size will go to 20 square feet, but it'll include, include the cross, option three. Single sign. Single sign. Is there a second? Second. Roll call vote. Council Member Bertrand. Aye. Council Member Peterson. Aye. Council Member Bottorf. Aye. Mayor Termini. Aye. We have a consensus. All right. Number three. Number three. What other decisions are you looking for from us? Because I think we're hundred foot setback. <laughs> we got oh the hundred foot setback. I think that died over lack of a second. Yep. Um, well, it was a joint. It was a. It was a, did it, did it it no, there was no second at all. Okay, there's nothing. So, okay. does someone want to make a motion about? Well, we don't need to make a motion about eliminating it. We just don't need to include it, right? You just don't need to include it. The last right. motion or the last decision would be the advertising. Oh no! The, oh, including the, the language for the advertising. Language, yeah. Good. Then let's. Let someone make a motion regarding the advertising and bring that advertising slide up. There it is. That sounded yeah. good to me. Is that a motion? If that's <laughs> a motion, yes. <laughs> Sounds good to me, motion by. A second. And a second by Kristen. Uh, roll call vote. Councilmember Bertrand. Aye. Councilmember Peterson. Aye. Councilmember Bottorf. Aye. And Mayor Termini. Aye. I'd like to say thank you for the community group that came up with the. Uh, good. Yes, this, well, this I, is I appreciate that participation. Thank you. What else you got for us? We <laughs> need to approve the first reading of the ordinance as amended for Chapter 5.36 and amending Municipal Code Chapter 17.24. Is that so moved? Yes. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. And adopt a resolution approving um, 
the background checks. So moved. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. What else you got? That's it. All That's contingent it. on the vote. That's all so. you got. So I want I have one more question. How long have you been working on this? Yeah, Since yeah. Three months. Since Rich left. <laughs> oh, geez. <laughs> <laughs> then an accelerated schedule. Okay. Accelerated schedule. In okay. April. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, we had a, a five-minute recess here before we go into the MOUs for the labor groups. This is not coming out. Okay, we're going to move on to uh, consider approval of memorandum of understanding with labor groups and adopt salary schedule. And I believe this is where I read a statement into the record. Yes. Before the city council this evening, as part of agenda item 10E, is a recommendation to approve salary and benefit packages for the following employee groups. Association of Capitola Employees, Confidential, Mid-Management, and At-Will Management Employees. The at-will management employees consist of department heads and the city manager. The benefit packages before the city council include a two and a quarter percent salary increase July 1st, 2018 for the listed groups, including at-will management and the city manager. A $1,500 one-time bonus will be provided for the listed groups, including at-will management. However, at the city manager's request, he will not receive the one-time bonus. He has declined it. The city health care contribution for ACE and confidential groups will be adjusted pursuant to the attached MOU and described in staff's presentation. 
for at-will management and the city manager, employees with dependents, the city health care contribution will increase by up to $487 per month, but the health insurance opt-out for those with other coverage will decrease by $523 a month. And now we'll have a staff report. Larry. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, council members. Um, so I'll, I'll be brief. What we, um, the mayor read the oral report. Um, major provisions of the agreement with the groups are this is a two-year agreement. There's going to be a 2.25% cost of living adjustment on July 1st, 2018 and 2019. Uh, employees will continue to pay 13.392% of their salary toward retirement costs. And included in there in July 1 of 2018 is a $1,500 one-time bonus for all employees in covered except, the, except for the city manager. The major difference between a couple of the groups is the cash in lieu. Um, the confidential mid-management and management employees agreed to reduce their cash in lieu immediately from $773 to $250 per month for those who have um, group coverage from other, other sources. The Association of Capitol Employees um, wanted to grandfather the employees that are currently using the cash in lieu and agreed to um, reduce the cash in lieu to 250 for all new employees or current employees who go take the city's health care. At that point, they have to, they would go back to $250 as well. And the differences are um, the contribution rates are higher for those groups that got rid of the cash in lieu or reduced it to $250 immediately. Um, the Associated Cap Capital employees, um, because they wanted to keep the employees that are using the cash in lieu at that level, the annual contributions from the city to health care are, are less in order to um, accommodate those costs. Um, so tonight, um, the recommended actions are to authorize the city manager to execute successor agreements um, with negotiated changes from July 1st through July, June 30th, 2020 with the Ca Association of Capital Employees, Mid-Management Employees Bargaining Unit, the Confidential Employees Man Management Unit, Bargaining Unit, excuse me. Approve the changes to the Management Compensation Plan approve changes to city manager's um, employer employee contract and adopt a resolution approving salary schedule from 7-1-2018 to 6-30-2019. If I'm here to answer questions. One, just a procedural question. Can that, can um, moving the recommended actions as a single motion work or do we need each of these items motion separately? You can do it as a single one. Good. The council members, if they had any uh, concerns, could ask you to break them out. But uh, are there any questions of staff? Is there anyone from the public who would like to speak to us? Connie, did you let him drink like three cups of coffee today? <laughs> <laughs> I thought we could wear him out by now. <laughs> yeah, well, I made a commitment to you. Uh, when you first started this endeavor with the library and being generous with uh, that and our special interest group said I would be back during negotiations, and Good. so I'm back. Good. And I'm I'm happy to see that you've come a long ways in settling some contracts. It's never an easy or fun time, but I see that we haven't quite settled with our uh, uh, public safety group. So, uh, and then in considering uh, this whole cannabis deal, which is one of my big concerns about having cannabis, it's it's an impact. Uh, you don't have to look too far. Talk to anybody. Well, you could talk to your police chief. I'm sure which you already have. But uh, Colorado, Washington, they're seeing a huge problem with black market uh, increase. They can't keep up with uh, the permit processing because of the black market. Uh, they're seeing 23% uh, um, increase in homelessness in Colorado Springs because since the mo uh, recreational marijuana sales. So um, it's gonna be an impact on our officers. My, I would hope that you would try to come to a, a resolution with them I'm not saying, I'm not asking, and because I came out of public safety, I, I understand the process, and I'm not saying we have to give them the world, but uh, it's a process, and, and we're having issues. We can't hire police officers. 
Um, it's a burden on them. We're a small town, we're a small community, huge influx of tourism that impacts their job. This cannabis is gonna impact their job. Uh, I would say, you know, maybe consider taking a portion of your, the only reason to have cannabis sales is tax revenue. That's the only reason to have it. So, hey, give part of that to uh, public safety. Let's dedicate part of that. But let's take care of our employees. Let's take care of our public safety people. And uh, I love all you guys. Don't, I, I, I may come off a little gruff sometimes because I'm passionate about Capitola. I'm passionate about uh, how we take care of Capitola. And, uh, but I also am passionate about taking care of our staff. It's a big service we provide, so thank you for your time. Thanks, TJ. We love you, too. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have a group hug after the meeting. <laughs> uh, seeing no one else coming up, I'll bring it back to the council. Move staff recommendation. Is there a second by Jacques Bertrand? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It is unanimous. Um, and so Stephanie, I guess, is left for the Yes. Uh, one absence? Yes. Yes. One absence. Uh, consider fee schedule, fiscal year 2018 19. Hello again, Mayor and Council. Uh, I don't have a PowerPoint for this one. I figured we'd be PowerPointed out by now. You pretty much. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, I have a 30 uh, slide. This item is the <laughs> fiscal year 2018 19 fee schedule. State law requires that the city conduct a public hearing anytime that we're making changes to the fee schedule that either increases fees or adds new additional fees. Um, just as way, way of reminder, the city completed a fee study back in November of 2015, and one of the recommendations out of that study was to um, review the fees annually and include a CPI increase. So, the fee schedule that is there before you. Um, all the fees have been increased by the Bay Area CPI of 3.2%, which was what the calendar year was, January through December, with the following exceptions. Recreation fees, we did not increase at all. They're still at the same level as last year. And then we have a couple of fees, three different fees that are established by the state. Um, notice of intent to circulate an initiative petition is $200. It's been $200, so there's no change to that one. Uh, notary service fees, the state has increased that from 10 to $15. I believe it's been $10 for probably 20 plus years. Um, and then the business license disability access and education fee is going from $1 to $4. Um, that one I bring up because in the past we have not charged that $1 fee. The city has basically taken $1,300 out of the general fund to cover that fee. So the recommendation, staff's recommendation is to increase it to four dollars to establish it and set it at four um, if we do not then that thirteen hundred dollars out of the general fund turns into five thousand dollars annually according to the state you can take this with a grain of salt the fee is going to be raised from one dollar to four dollars for through 2023 and then go back to one dollar i'll believe that when i see it go back to one dollar <laughs> um <laughs> Oh, and, and those fees, so those fees have to be spent on disability access and programs and construction. Um, so the recommended action is to conduct the public hearing on the proposed fee schedule and adopt the proposed resolution repealing resolution number 4077 and adopting the new fee schedule. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions of staff? Seeing none, anyone from the public? Then we'll bring it back to the council. What is your will? Move staff recommendation. Second. Second by Councilmember Peterson. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So we are now at the end of the city council meeting. Don't put your papers away yet, oh, boys on. and girls. There's more. Because the city council meeting is now adjourned and we will now open the meeting for the city of Capitola as successor agency to the former Capitola Redevelopment Agency meeting of Thursday, I, June 28th. I've got to do my electronic thing. Eighth. And I will need a a board, uh, agency board roll call, please. Um, Whenever you're ready, no rush. Okay. Do, do you want to? Uh, I would just note that the members, uh, okay, <laughs> Council Member Bertram. You're not Council Members, but you're Commissioners. Bert Council Bert Member Bert okay. Member. Commissioner Bertrand is oh, here. Oh, board member, board member Peterson. Here. Board member Bator. Here. And Chair Termini. Here. And, uh, Board member uh, Harlan is absent. Um, let's see, are there any additional materials? 
No. Additions and deletions to the agenda. Staff has no changes. Public comments. There's one consent calendar item. And that is consider the May 30th, 2018 joint budget workshop minutes. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <laughs> None. It's unanimous. Yeah. The government's a marvelous thing. Uh, general government hearings adopt fiscal year budget 2018-19. Approve the resolution adopting fiscal year successor agency budget. Is there any public comment on this? Is there a staff report? Uh, the only thing I would say is that this is really just kind of the, the ROPS payment, so it's revenue in, revenue out, uh, right. same thing that we do each year. It's included in the, the budget document that you've seen before. Questions of staff? <laughs> Hearing none and seeing no public comment, is there a motion? Move staff recommendation. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It's unanimous with the exception of Councilmember Harlan. And now the successor agency to the former redevelopment agency meeting is adjourned. Oh, my ears. Well done. <laughs>